go. We're good to go. All right. Let me call to order this uh, 1230 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council on February 14th, 2023. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom. Present. Um, Brown, here. Watkins, here. Bruner, present. Helen Torrey Johnson, present. Vice Mayor Golder, here. And Mayor Keeley, here. Having established a quorum, our first order of business will be item one to refer to closed session a, an item relating to the municipal wharf. Anyone have a question or comment on this item? A motion to include this in our closed session would be in order. So moved. Second. So moved by Ms. Watkins, seconded by Ms. Brown. Clerk will call the roll. Hmm. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Torrey Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Ma motion passes and so ordered. That will be added to our closed session agenda. Uh, we are now preparing to go into closed session. There are noticed items for the public. If you wish to make comments on closed session items, this would be the time and place to do so. Let me start with anyone who is with us in chambers this afternoon. Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Well, you do have someone, but his hand isn't raised, so um, I could assume he does not want to speak. Okay. I'm going to give that person just a quick second to make sure that we know whether they want to speak on this item or not. It appears that the person does not. The meeting now will be adjourned to closed session, and we will return after we have finished our business. Like Recording you. stopped.
the hour of 1 one thirty, having arrived this session of the Santa Cruz City Council for February 14th, 2023, will be in session. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Uh, Bruner? Present. Helen Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, we will move along. The first item here is presiding officer's announcements. Uh, I want to announce that at our last council meeting, uh, I spoke in a terse manner to our city clerk, and it is not enough to offend in public and apologize in private. I want to apologize in public for the tone of my remark, and I apologize to the city clerk, and uh, I appreciate your good work, that of your assistant in your office. Thank you very much for that. Let me go to statements of disqualification. Is there any member who wishes to make a statement of disqualification on any items on our agenda? Seeing and hearing none. Additions and deletions. Madam Clerk, do we have additions or deletions to the consent agenda or any other part of our agenda? We do not. We do not. Thank you very much. Mr. Condotti. Does the city attorney have any reportable items out of closed session today? Yes, thank you, Mayor Ely and members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the council met uh, in closed session in the courtyard conference room to discuss three items of city council business. First item was a conference with labor negotiators and the council received a report from and gave direction to its uh, negotiator uh, involving the following groups. Police Officers Association, Police Management, and SEIU temporary employees. Item two was real property negotiations. The property in question is uh, 45 Municipal Wharf. The <coughs> city's negotiator uh, gave a report to and received direction from the city council uh, involving uh, price terms of payment or both or a potential lease of that property. Item three was a conference with legal Council involving existing litigation, the matter currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court entitled County of Santa Cruz versus the City of Santa Cruz. And on that item, uh, Mayor and Council members, the Council uh, by motion authorized the City Attorney's Office to file a writ of mandate in the 6th Appellate District challenging a decision by the Superior Court last month uh, overruling a demur that the City Attorney's Office filed in that case. So we will be preparing and filing a writ of mandate in the 6th Appellate District on that. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, we are on the uh, council meeting calendar. Uh, do you have any additions for us for that? I do not. Thank you. Members, we are on the consent agenda. This is items 6 through 31, inclusive. Members of the public, if you wish to comment on this, uh, the city clerk will put the instructions for you up on the screen. Uh, this would be, we will get that, there we go. Uh, these act items will all be acted upon on one motion uh, unless a member pulls this and, and we will handle it somewhat differently. Let me ask if there are questions or comments from members regarding any item on the consent agenda. Ms. Brown. I just have a quick question yes. on item 20. Please. Uh, so this is a traffic signal maintenance item, and I just, and I'm sorry I didn't get to ask this question earlier, if anyone is able to answer it, if not, it's okay, um, but I'd, I'd just like to know, if not now, at some point, um, if the contractor who is listed here is the current contractor for our traffic signals, or if we're, um, this, I just couldn't tell from the, the agenda report. Um, but if there isn't anybody <laughs> available right at this moment to answer that question, I'd just love to get an uh, answer at some point. Um, but I do support the item. City manager, is there, can you provide anything on that?
Uh, thank you for the question, Councilmember Brown. I'm looking to see if we have Nathan Nguyen or anyone with uh, Public Works. We do have uh, Dan, who is from Public Works. He's just logged in. Okay, let's give we it one my, second. My cries. <laughs> we'll try to get you an answer to that question. Mr. Nguyen, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Council. If you could repeat the question, sorry for jumping on there late. Uh, and my apologies for not getting this to you sooner. I am just on item 20, uh, the traffic signals, wondering if the contractor that's uh, involved in this um, this item is a contractor we work with, currently work with. Um, okay, just wanted to, to check on that. Yeah, Cal West is a contractor that we've been contracting our traffic signal maintenance with the last five years. Okay. They're also the same contractor that the County of Santa Cruz and the City of Watsonville use, so they have great familiarity with our area. Thank you so much. I and I really will get these questions to you in advance. I just I, this is an important issue for the community and for safety. So wanted to make sure. Thanks. Further questions or comments on the consent agenda? Madam Clerk, Mr. Cardno had requested additional time. Is he with us online now? He is with us. Yes. Let's go to him. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, City Council. My name is Serge Cagno, um, and I am the director of the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Um, I wanted to speak for a minute about the opioid settlement fund agreement on uh, number seven on the consent agenda. Yes, sir. Opioid, uh, the opioid epidemic has uh, raged across our country and had effects um, throughout the United States, and the settlements are attempts at uh, mitigating the issues uh, that our community has. Uh, the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz supports people, whether that's mental health, substance use, domestic violence, social isolation, um, or justice involved. Uh, there are 57 Recovery Cafes across the United States, each one with different contracts to support <clears throat> different groups as their as their <clears throat> community needs. Uh, we would just, the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz just ask that the city of Santa Cruz as it is looking to um, provide services and support our community, re remembers the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Uh, in light of this, um, we are setting up a, a tour next Wednesday of the Recovery Cafe San Jose, um, and the city council uh, is definitely invited to come to see uh, the kind of services that we're talking about that we're growing in Santa Cruz. Um, I'll be in touch with each of you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh Two thoughts on that, sir. Thank you for your good work back in a few years ago on the Council Advisory Committee on Homelessness. We appreciated your participation in that. As to the Recovery Cafe, and I know you know this, sir, uh, when I had the good fortune of teaching at San Jose State University, uh, one of my students, uh, one of the students that I had the pleasure of teaching uh, was uh, the operator of that for uh, a substantial period of time and uh, shared a lot of her thoughts uh, about the Recovery Cafe uh, during class uh, at various points. And uh, thank you for, for your testimony and thank you for the good work that the Recovery Cafe does on a regular basis. Let me see if there are other, Ms. Bruner. I had a quick question uh, regarding number seven. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we know at this time um, the general timeline or process for how to determine who will be on that stakeholder group um, from the city? I appreciate the public comment we received and um, I think you know, this. there's a lot of questions around this topic. So thanks for the question, uh, Councilmember uh, Bruner. You'll note in the packet that each agency as part of the settlement agreement will have the opportunity to appoint a representative from each jurisdiction to the stakeholder group. Uh, that question uh, will come back to the council. Uh, we've been in discussions with the other agencies as to whether or not that will be a member of staff uh, or a member of uh, city council or board of supervisors, depending upon the agency. So uh, we'll have more information for you as, as the group comes together. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions or comments? On item 12, if uh, 
without objection, if we could request that, uh, Mr. Huffaker, if you could provide the council with copies of that application uh, when you have submitted it. And secondly, would uh, we would add, uh, I would add additional comment. I don't know that it needs to be direction. Would you be certain that we engage our state legislative delegation in this activity? This seems particularly important for us in our relationships with HCD as we continue our backing and forthing with them relative to our housing element of our general plan. Happy to do so on both counts, Mayor. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Mayor, sorry, I yes, apologize. Please. I do have one more person. Certainly. For Let's go to that person online. Who is that person? Mr. Phillips, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, as to item 10, the amendment to the Brown Act, giving the presiding officer the authority to remove, I assume forcibly, people from meetings if they disrupt or disturb meetings, it's a new low in rights removed from the people to address and request a redress of grievances. One wonders whether handcuffs, hog tying, and being tossed out like a sack of potatoes followed by a trip down to the station are involved. I kind of get this when disturbances occur that are not by those whose recognized time is to be heard and who disrupt and impede the continuation of a meeting, but simply disrupt or disturbs is too big, subjective, contains a garbage circular definition, and doesn't exclude when it shouldn't apply. The whole tyrannical reason for these amendments to the Brown Act is that lately the people are showing they are justifiably really pissed off at the government actions that severely and negatively impacted their lives. It's the really pissed off parents confronting school boards when their children are being groomed and mostly without their knowledge and consent, exposing their children to accept explicit or pornographic content and perhaps in their opinion, deviant and quite unnecessary and age inappropriate presentations of a sexual nature or when their children are being groomed to accept racial victimization, hate theories of the cultural Marxist variety or when city councils contemplate tyrannical policies which damage people's economic well-being putting them essentially under house arrest, ruining livelihoods, or mandate they get injected with experimental gene therapies in Nuremberg-style violations of human rights, or attempt to confiscate and control property. Yes, they get really pissed off sometimes and let authorities know just how they feel. Now, authorities want to stop this so they can go about their overlord objectionable business without fully facing those experiencing the negative consequences of their actions. It figures this would occur under Emperor Newsom's watch. Almost anything could now be considered disrupting or disturbing a meeting. You're under no obligation to be quite as verbatim authoritarian writing this into policy. It is badly missing a clarity this will never, ever be used to infringe on a purely critical expression of free speech by those individuals when the order is within their time and right to address an item to the council. It doesn't say that. I also don't see why you're having a problem with affirming allegiance to liberty and justice for all, or an installing a uh, compelled speech where the council must vote yes, but not I, or now keeping outside agency developments opaque as any kind of positive modification. Uh, there were at least two occasions I recall when the sergeant was called to assist removal of someone from the podium. One did not address the item at all and refused to have even uh, after their time expired, and one for expressing council displeasure by purposely addressing the council with his back turned who never did get to fully address the council at all since they abruptly were assessed. One of those people should have been removed, the other not, and there is a difference. Expressing criticism, using free speech, even loud or rude, should be allowed, and this new law may well get tested by the courts. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Ms. Bush, anyone else on? There's nobody else. Okay. We have, uh, we're at a point where a motion on the consent agenda would be in order. I'll move consent. Ms. Watkins moves and Ms. Golder seconds approval of the consent agenda. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Commentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on item 24. This is the consent public hearing item. Item 24 is a second and final adoption of an ordinance amending portions of the municipal code relating to process appointments to the city commissions. Let me ask if there are questions or comments from members. 
Seeing and hearing none, I would ask if there are public comments from anyone who is with us today in the audience. If you are not with us today and you wish to make comment on this item, the instructions for you are on the screen. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do not. We no. do not. No one with us today wishing to a motion to approve as submitted would be in order. Item. Ms. Brown moves item 24. Is there a second? Ms. Bruner uh, seconds. Debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, we will move to a vote. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Uh, Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Members, we are on item number 25. This is a resolution of intent to annex parcels at 538 Center Street into parking district number one. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Claire Gologli, Transportation Planner for the City and Public Works. The item before you is really a simple cleanup item. Calvary Church, uh, the affordable housing project there, they contacted us and let us know that because their property is bisected by a tax boundary, they have been unable to get an APN number and move forward with necessary steps. We have always treated this lot as part of parking district number one. It was formerly a public parking lot that we had as part of the parking district, even though half of the parcels were outside the district. The item in front of you is a notice of intent to annex all of these parcels into the district. We have um, coordinated with the developer there and they have elected, we gave them the option, would you like to be in or out of the district? They felt that the benefits of being in were um, good for their residents. And so the item before you starts this process, you'll see a follow-up item on the 28th, which will be a notice to annex, and then uh, the, the project will be able to move forward and obtain APNs. So I'm available if you have any questions, but really a pretty simple cleanup. Questions or comments? Let me ask if the public has any comments on this item, anyone with us today, or anyone who may be calling in online? Nobody online. No one online, no public comment. Matter is back before the body. A motion to approve will be in order. So Ms. Moves. Watkins yeah. moves and uh, Ms. Kalantari Johnson seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna spread this around a little bit. <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Uh, Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries in its order. Thank, Thank you, you for your presentation. Members, we are on item 26, Sister City Committee appointment. If uh, anyone who is uh, who's online will we'll, uh, give them the opportunity to see how to participate in this. Uh, public comment on this appointment. No one with us today in chambers wishes to comment. Let me give folks who may be online a moment to discern whether they would like to make any kind of comment on item 26. On this item? Yes. Uh, on no, I, I was saying I came at 1 o'clock and you guys were in closed session. Now, I'll comment on this. Was at one time, uh, Watsonville. And Mo, Mo, if you're going to speak, like if you're going to speak, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Can we get your name for the record? Okay. Number one, I'd like to see later. Oh no, uh, let me. Uh, uh, let me. I asked oh. a question. Would you be kind enough to state your name for the record? Oh, sure. Thank you. You, you remember I wasn't Nicholas. No, I know. I'm Richard you're Lewis. Mr. Lewis, of course. And uh, it's it's really nice. I'll be back at your next meeting. Uh, because this city has the leadership to do something, both county and city, of sister, sister. Uh, Filippi himself, from the county, he went to Mexico. I'd just like to put out there that possibility would be to create a county, county, city, city, somewhere. I'd love it to be Guadalajara, Jalisco. So I will, my public comment is, that we don't, I do not believe we have in Santa Cruz a sister city, but boy, we have the population 
and at the commission countywide, they didn't even have a quorum in their February meeting. So please, as leaders, take a look at how nice it would be to go to Jalisco, Guadalajara, and I'd love to work with anybody toward that of what we could do. And thank you. Please, if they'll pass that out. I have been busy since since the letter from what was it, 1985, which w w you'll get a chance to look at. Thank you for um, that. My name's not important. The people that are sitting here, it's your destiny to make Santa Cruz what it could be. So I'll be back. I can't be here tonight. I'm going to be up with the students at UC. Mr. Thank Lewis. you very much for letting me be at the mic. Thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate it. Sir. All right. Sister, sister, it could be done. Got it. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? Still no one online, correct, Ms. Bush? Um, right. No one. Good to go. All right. Uh, matters back before the council. There is a recommended uh, motion to appoint a member to the committee. Does anyone have a nomination? Ms. Brunner? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's you? okay. That's Ms. Bruner, then. I nominate Isabella Bonner. Okay. There is a nomination for Ms. Bonner to be appointed to the Sister City Commission. Is there any, are there any other nominees? No. Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, the appropriate motion is to appoint, correct? Um, by consensus, we can do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is a motion and a second. Uh, to appoint Ms. Bonner as nominated by Ms. Bruner. Uh, is there uh, any objection? Seeing and hearing none, a unanimous voice vote, or excuse me, a unanimous vote has been taken and the appointment is approved. Members, we are on item number 27. This is a response to the 2021 Independent Police Auditor, Auditor Report. Uh, let me also make sure that we are going to be, which Ms. Bush will, put the uh, information up on the screen real quick for how to participate. Uh, we will begin uh, by asking uh, Ms. Brothers, the principal management analyst, uh, for this uh, presentation to come forward and make a presentation. Hmm. Or not as the case may be. Um, I will find out where she is. Thank you so much. We're, what we're going to do is stand in recess for five minutes.
We are back from our brief recess. The council is back in session. I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Brothers, uh, Police Chief, Deputy Chief. Thank you all very much for being here. Ms. Brothers, we will uh, recognize you for a presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley. Yes, I'll be the one presenting, but uh, Ms. Brothers deserves all the credit for the construction of the product. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. My apologies for being a little tardy. Um, I'm here today to present um, on our actions as a police department to the 2021 Independent Police Auditor and the recommendations that came out of that and the things that uh, we have adjusted, changed, or modified and, and some things that we are still currently working on as we speak. So briefly, uh, OIR is the company uh, that, that we are contracted with. They reviewed uh, 13 public complaints investigations um, that's not the entire year of complaints it's the ones that they selected to to review uh, they reviewed 13 public complaints two administrative investigations in other words in other words uh, investigations that we self-initiated uh, an investigation on certain actions and then two other policing performance matters that they also provided some feedback on. Uh, in total, as you saw in the report that was provided to you, there were a total of 26 recommendations and out of, um, I believe the 17 incidents that they looked at, we had several there uh, that did not provide or did not require any sort of recommendations or feedback from OIR. Um, so I'm going to provide really just a high level. I'm not going to go through each and every recommendation. As you saw, some of the rec recommendations um, were redundant. Um, but uh, I'll give it more of a high level of some of the actions that we've taken since we've worked through this report with, with the independent auditor. Um, first and foremost, we addressed and updated our policy on, on transporting persons that are in custody. Um, in addition to the updated policy, we also included the, the new government code 7286.5B4, which also required additional mitigations put in place for the well being of those in our custody. Secondly, uh, we have an updated policy. Actually, let me back up real quickly. Uh, really what that new policy states is um, we are required to keep constant observation uh, of the individual that's in our custody. Our policy already required the use of a seatbelt, but in some circumstances, it's not practical to seatbelt somebody. And then that's, if that's the case, we need to remain constantly observant of their position, and the new government code covers positional asphyxiation and the preventative measures for, for that. Uh, updated policy 421 of the mobile audio and video in our cars. Um, again, along the same lines related to the same incident, we changed our policy now to require at all times when somebody is in the back of our patrol car and in our custody uh, that our um, in-car camera system will be activated to capture any sort of incidents or issues along the way when we're transporting, whether to the hospital or, or to the county jail. Um, new policy 343, use of force review board. Um, this is still in the works. Uh, we are working closely with the auditor uh, to create the best policy possible and constructing um, the use of force review board, which is an internal board that will be um, constructed with some use of force experts, instructors, 
um, in some cases like uh, a training manager uh, with the intent of this review board to um, not review the compliance of policy, but more so um, the, I guess, analysis of, of tactics and training. Um, <clears throat> we have to make sure that these two processes, in other words, the current professional standards process of compliance with policy versus how can we get better, even if policy wasn't, was adhered to, how can we get better with our tactics, uh, our training, and our equipment to be more effective, even though we may have been within policy? So we're still um, on our second uh, version of that policy that we have sent to our independent auditor for suggestions. Round one included suggestions. We've incorporated those, and, and we are now sending round two back to the auditor for a, a thorough review to make sure we get that right. Um, we've updated policy 305, officer-involved shooting uh, and deaths, sort of um, the, the shooting and deaths or commission <laughs> incident policy. Um, this one is uh, also includes certain recommendations that were made by, by the auditor. Um, check my notes real quick. Yeah, this one is also one that is, is being reviewed and, and double-checked by the independent auditor about refining a few of the recommendations that they made, and, and we think that we got this one, this one right as well. Um, and as you see at the bottom there, these updates or new policies that we've put into place cover at a minimum those five recommendations in the report that you have in front of you. Uh, one of the more highlighted events in the, in the report was uh, an incident in, uh, that resulted in, in the recommendation around bias by proxy sort of policy and or um, issues that they felt we should address. Um, just so you know, uh, <clears throat> we currently are required to take a five-hour course when you're in, going through the police academy and you recertify with that same uh, bias-based bias, bias -based policing requirement every five years. That is required by post. Um, our last updated training was in 2020. We also have this coming year uh, a training course, an eight-hour training course titled Strategic Communications, which will also include cultural diversity as part of the curriculum of the class. Um, so point being is we are constantly uh, training and updating our staff on these skills, um, which we believe cover the bias by proxy recommendation from the auditor. In addition to all of the training that we currently do and have done and will continue to do, um, if you recall, some of you that were on council, there was an ordinance passed uh, in November of 2021 9.86, which covered discriminatory reports to law enforcement. Um, and that was in part a result of, of the auditor's report. Um, and we also currently have a policy, policy 401, which is titled bias-based policing, which prohibits uh, bias-based policing in any way, shape, or form, and has uh, been in existence prior to this report. I feel through all three of these points, um, the recommendation or suggestions are thoroughly covered um, as far as the concerns out of the report. Um, <clears throat> so one of the recommendations had to do with um, our policy, the way it existed, 1,009 personnel complaints. This is another uh, policy that we continue to work with alongside with the auditors. 
uh, we have sent the second version back to them for hopefully a final uh, sign off or approval or any other suggestions they may they may uh, come up with. Um, it's a lengthy po uh, policy. As you can see down at the bottom, it covers uh, at least seven of the recommendations out of this report. A lot of it had to do with um, processing personnel complaints, uh, the timeliness of our investigations, um, and also uh, communications um, not only during but after uh, a complaint investigation is completed. So, um, as you can see here, the policy as it sits now, it's intended to improve the documentation and the, rec the receiving of a complaint from the community, or even if it's an internally um, generated complaint. It addresses the timeliness, the, the, the policy before. I think it was more of the unwritten rule. We've always done it that way, but it was never really written down. So in this case, we've, we've documented and addressed the timeliness of the investigations and the necessary steps to take if there's going to be a delay. And it also improves the communication with the complainant. Ultimately, um, we respond to the complainant with what we call a disposition letter um, articulating what we learned um, and, and uh, also offer them the opportunity to come uh, view the body-worn camera evidence if that is uh, applicable with that particular complaint. In essence, we're trying to be more responsive to the complaint. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we, we are now, since we received the original report from the auditor, we started the process of issuing disposition letters um, to the complainant with an outcome. We, we understand we can't necessarily disclose if there were certain um, disciplinary matters taken into, into place uh, or that, that occurred, um, but we do thank them for the opportunity to learn and, and get better. Um, again, when it's applicable, we, we provide the access to the, the body camera footage. Um, up to this point, nobody has um, followed back up with us and, and taken that opportunity, but we do offer it. In not every circumstance is it applicable. Um, just it depends on the on the nature of the complaint. Um, we're, we're utilizing what we believe to be better uh, internal software to better track not only the receiving of the complaints, um, the completion of the complaints, and also. Uh, implementing the recommendations of a complaint. Sometimes we may not have discipline that comes out of a complaint, but we might have the implementation of training, for example. We want to make sure that we check that box and make sure that that, that training has been implemented. Um, and also we currently uh, meet, myself, Deputy Chief John Bush, and Sergeant Eric Coppy, we meet twice a month. We go over uh, everything that's on Sergeant Hoppy's list um, and ensure that we're better tracking the timeliness of our investigations. And again, at the bottom, you'll see there's at least six recommendations that are covered in this new policy. <coughs> that's all I have for you today, this afternoon. Chief, thank you very much. Let me see if there are questions or comments by members of the council. Any questions around here? Question around here? Uh, I'll take the opportunity to ask a couple if I might, Chief. Uh, take a look at uh, recommendation number three, which is on page 27.2 of the agenda packet. The question I have on this is uh, the constant monitoring issue. Does that mean then if you are transporting someone 
that you've got two officers in the vehicle then, one who's driving, one who's paying attention 100% of the time to the person in the vehicle, or is the person driving also trying to pay attention to the person in the vehicle? If, if necessary, it would require to put a second officer in the vehicle. If the subject in the back is um, sitting up, if you will, even if they're not seat belted in, then the driver of the vehicle can monitor and the camera's also activated. Um, if the individual, if we lose sight of the individual and they've now slumped down into more of a positional as mm -hmm. asphyxiation kind of concern, then the, the instruction is to pull over and we may need to get another officer uh, involved in that or, or at least try to sit them up. Please take a, thank you, sir. Please take a look at item five on the same page in the agenda packet. This is the officer involved shooting death uh, policy to define the use of force in the review boards. Um, you address that in your opening comments. Uh, it says here that uh, would define the use of force review boards, composition, duties, timelines, meetings, and scope. Uh, could you go to the scope question? and help us, on, at least help me. Others have had this opportunity, uh, my first uh, opportunity on the council to do this, but I'm interested in the scope question. Yeah, that's a great question because we actually had a follow-up meeting with the auditor to clarify the scope as well, because I had not concerns about a review board, but I had concerns about um, kind of duplicating the efforts of a internal investigation. Mm -hmm and what, what that looks like. Do they, for example, what if they come up with a uh, policy violation that they've identified that was not identified in the professional standards unit investigation, mm -hmm. or vice versa? Um, that creates a problem. Um, so we talked a little bit about that because there's also, um, there's a recommendation that that board debriefs a situation with an officer or officers, right, to learn. The problem with that is if it becomes more of a um, internal investigation on policy, mm -hmm. there's rights and rules we have to follow with that, that interview. Or, but we want it to be more of a casual learning conversation. So um, the scope, to your question, the scope is going to be specifically focused on training, tactics, uh, equipment, communications, how can we learn and get better? And we'll, we'll bifurcate that investigation and leave the uh, potential policy violation and potential discipline investigation to the professional standards unit. If that makes sense. Thank you. If you would take a look at item Recommendation number 15 on page 27.4 in our agenda packet. This is a policy which reevaluate this complaint by focusing on principles of bias by proxy when responding to calls for service. You address that twice in your opening comments. Here's my question. Does, how often does POST, the Peace Officer Standards and Training, up there, up date their training on this point. You can keep getting trained by them. Do they keep updating their training on this dimension? Um, that's a great question as well, and I don't have the answer to okay. that. I would get have, back to, to, us on I would that, have would to get you? back to Thank you. how often they uh, update their, their Thank curriculum. you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Let me ask if, the, uh, I'm going to ask again if there are members with questions. Anyone with us today who would like to comment on this, ask questions? I see no one here. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online, or shall we give them an opportunity here? We do have um, one here. person so far. Good. You tell me when they're ready. I'm ready. All right, we are good to go. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm. Uh, this is Peter Gelblum. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, 
I have an overall request that you postpone consideration of this item at least until the next meeting because the policy that's available to the public online the Santa Cruz Police Policy Manual does not has not been updated to reflect any of the updates that the chief and the response have mentioned. Uh, 15, I might count 15 of the 26 responses say recommendation completed, policy such and such updated. Uh, that's not available to the public, so we have no way of looking at what's there. So I just ask that you put this off to the next meeting or until the policy online can be updated because we have no way of checking to see what's been done. Um, so I think that's a reasonable request. Um, if you don't do that, uh, let me give you a couple of specific comments I have, although I really think you should do that to be fair to the public to make this a meaningful review and a meaningful public meeting. Certainly. Uh, first of all, I agree with the um, letter that Mr. Gettleman sent in regarding recommendations one and two. Um, the auditor recommended that interviews of um, uh, officers involved in critical incidents be completed before the end of shift uh, rather than uh, whenever they get around to it and feel like it. And whenever the, off the officer gets rights that no member of the public would get, if the officer doesn't feel like he's emotionally capable or psychologically capable, he can request it to be put off. Um, uh, the existing policies 305 and its subsets specifically require that the officer's physical and psychological needs be taken into account. No member of the public gets that right. You have a right to an attorney, but you don't remember and say, well, I'm a little crazed right now. This is terrible. I don't want to be interviewed. The police officer should not get any more rights than the public has when they have been involved in killing or seriously wounding a, a, a resident of this county. Um, secondly, um, uh, I agree with the writer who wrote in about recommendation 21 about the um, providing access to the body worn camera footage. The chief uh, said, kept saying that when it's uh, appropriate or relevant, I forget exactly the word he used, um, way too much discretion. Um, the SCPD should be uh, required to uh, give very specific guidelines as to when they feel that not providing footage is required and providing footage should be the default. Thank you. But again, I, I do request that you put this off until the policy is available to the public. Thank you. Mr. Gelblum, thank you very much for your participation. Chief, I saw you taking a couple of notes. Do you wish to make comment on that item, sir? Well, I'll, I'll address the, um, the issue about timeliness of interviewing a, an officer involved in a critical incident. Um, I believe that I agree with most of the things that were in that um, email. I think our objective and our goal is the same, and that is to get a thorough, accurate, timely um, statement from the officers that are involved and get to the truth of the matter. However, I think that it is um, inappropriate to ask a human being to provide such a critical statement in some circumstances where they may have been up for almost 24 hours. And I will use the example of our recent incident where that occurred at 5.30 in the morning and those officers had been working since 10 o'clock the night before. So I don't know when they had last slept. At that point, we initiate a county protocol that brings in the district attorney's office who's gonna conduct the interview. We bring in the sheriff's office who's gonna do the evidence processing. There's a lot of things that are going on and at some point actually the ship's not driven by me, it's driven by other entities. The interview for those officers was projected to occur at about two o'clock in the afternoon. They started their shift at 10 o'clock the night before. I'm not interested in the officers going home to conjure up a different story which I think will all be captured on the body-worn camera. I'm interested in a fair process for them. I'm interested in a thorough investigation, an accurate investigation. Um, 
that I do not believe we will achieve with somebody that's been up for 18 plus hours. On top of all of that, they have a right to an attorney and their attorneys are usually coming from the Bay Area, which we don't control how long that will take. So quite frankly, uh, I agree with the recommendation in that particular case, I believe it was three to four days after the district attorney's office completed an interview. Um, I think we need to learn from that. Um, but I think when you have somebody that's been up, a human being that's been up for 18, 20 hours straight, I think you're gonna get a better result and product after they get 68 hours of sleep. That's my response to that one. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that comment. Did, let me see uh, other questions or comments. Ms. Brown. Well, I wanted to follow up um, on another point that was made by the caller, and thank you for the uh, report. Uh, thank you for all the work that went into it. It was well organized, very helpful, um, and I um, just wanted to check on the question about the policy manual updates um, because I did go back and reference the SCPD handbook as I was reading this item, but I can't tell where updates have occurred. So if, is it the case that the old policy is still the public version? So, okay, so th there are um, members of the public who are interested in weighing in on this and um, have not been able to see that policy as of th those changes as of yet. Can we um, estimate when they may be available to the public? I think uh, since we're on our second round of edits, uh, I think that we are getting really close. The other caveat to this I forgot to explain was every year Lexapool, who manages our policies, um, they provide legal updates at the beginning of every calendar year. And so every year, January, early February, our policies are in flux because we're reviewing policy. Some of it is mandated uh, law that we incorporate into our new policies. Some of it is suggestions that we have to review and approve or not. So that was the other reason instead of doing it twice, we're doing it all at once. Um, I think probably within the next 30 days, we should have this wrapped up, would be my, my estimate. Thank you. Um, and then um, I think the second question or point, maybe it was the first one, I took it maybe out of order. Um, as I mentioned, we offer the opportunity for complainants to come and, and view the body-worn camera themselves. Um, there are certain circumstances where it would be inappropriate for us to do that. Uh, as an example, if there's juveniles in the body-worn camera footage, that's inappropriate for us to show. We could redact the video. That's going to take significant staff time. Um, there's certain circumstances where a third party makes a complaint that was not related or associated with the incident. I feel it would be inappropriate for me to show some body-worn camera footage when a third party is viewing it. Maybe that individual is in a particular place, whether it's lack of clothing, uh, in the middle of a personal, very personal event that's in their home. I don't think that those are circumstances that should be exposed to a third party. So I think to say blanket statement that everybody should be able to see all body-worn body camera is, is um, irresponsible, to be honest. Um, I think that I should have the ability to, um, to have that discretion when it's applicable to offer that opportunity, and when it's not, it's not applicable. Ms. Brown. Just a, a quick follow-up on that. I, I hear you, and thank you for providing some of the examples of cases in which uh, that policy would, a blanket policy wouldn't be, um, uh, uh, you know, helpful. <laughs> I'm just trying to think all the all the words, um, and but I do wonder: is, would it be possible to include some kind of guidelines around what the what the circumstances are that might be helpful for the public to, you know, so in third party cases, 
and or where there are minors or personal, just to kind of lay out what you just said um, very basically so that people can have, there's some, it's something legible for the public about what their rights are to make those kinds of requests. Um, because it's, it just seems like, like once I heard it, I, I, that made total sense to me, but without knowing that, it, I could understand how members of the public might have some concern. So just, just wondering if that is something that could be considered. We could try. I think it's hard to capture all the what ifs. Really sure, is. sure. So I, it, I mean, general, more that's generally. That's what concerns me, and so that's why I feel I, I have the, the ability to make the decision. Um, and, and, you know, our objective is to be fully, fully transparent. Um, and uh, we do currently offer that opportunity to people in the disposition letters. Um, and I feel like we've been you know, responsive to the recommendations of the auditor to do that. Um, it's just really hard to capture all the po potential scenarios and lock us in, in policy. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Thank you, Chief Escalante. Um, I, you know, this is interesting. Um, I had also several questions. I appreciate you answering them in advance um, when reading through this. And it's interesting to hear that um, some of those questions are again being asked um, on the recommendations number three, number two and number 21. Um, so I think in, after talking with you and hearing a lot of the um, scenarios that do occur in situations with um, body cameras and footage and accessibility to that footage, um, it's hard to, um, make it a black and white uh, 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 list. I want to see a list. I, you know, when we were talking, I was asking, what are all the reasons why not? And I think in the um, interest of transparency, um, as you're going through a second draft, to just consider if there are any language um, tweaks that would help the public feel ensured that um, it is accessible. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm wondering if these updates, which were in our agenda packet, which is accessible to the public, if they can also be on the these um, recommendations and the responses temporarily, if they can be on the SCPD website, um, so that anybody who did not see the agenda packet would also have access to this. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think we typically just try to um, communicate and present to, to all of you first, and then now we can probably put that up. Thank you for um, all of the responses and for all of the, the work. And um, there's a lot in here, so I'm, I, I really appreciate all of um, I want to say that you're, I have no doubt at how thoughtful you are at taking each of these recommendations seriously. So thank you. Further questions or comments? Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No, there's not. Good. All right. Uh, there would be a motion to accept the report is the appropriate motion. Is there such a motion? Motion by Ms. Calantari Johnson. Second by Mr. Newsom. Uh, under debate and discussion, Chief, let me add my thanks and appreciation to you and the women and men of the Santa Cruz Police Department. All of you do all the time, every day, every night, every neighborhood protecting us, serving us. Thank you for all of that. Please have to pass that along to every member of your staff, both sworn and civilian. We thank you all deeply, deep gratitude for keeping us safe. Thank you. 
for the questions or comments seen in here. Ms. Brown. Just a quick comment, because we did have a speaker who uh, follows this very closely and has been really engaged on um, issues of policing in our community, and I appreciate that, um, Mr. Gelblum. And, and so I just do want to say um, I, I recognize your, your interest in uh, postponing this. The, the idea that we may have it in 30 days makes me want to. Um, make that motion, but I'm, I'm not hearing, um, I, it seems like people are ready to accept the report. And given that, um, I would just say, um, perhaps once that policy is up and you know we've accepted the report, um, it, it doesn't mean that we're making recommendations about policy changes. We are um, accepting this here, but that comments or you know, if you wanna have a follow-up conversation once that policy handbook is available and the updates are made, um, I'm willing to have that conversation and um, see if there is, is more that we want to try to do or community members want to try to do with this document. So, um, and I don't mean to say massive policy changes, but if you, if you want to review this, um, this iteration, um, I'm here and willing to talk about that. Um, but I don't think that accepting it today is necessarily going to change the outcome, so I'll support this. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. Members, we are on item number 28. And this is an ordinance related to the annual living wage adjustment index. We will have a staff presentation from Mr. Geese. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, council members and Mayor Keeley. Uh, this ordinance relates to the living wage ordinance, which requires the city to, or the people who contract with the city must pay their employers, their employees, a minimum living wage. And each year that is upwardly indexed based on the uh, consumer price index for the San Francisco Bay Area region. In 2018, uh, the finance department, or in 2018, BLS actually ceased uh, publishing the CPI that's referenced in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. And so this amendment is essentially a cleanup and it inserts the accurate CPI so that each year it can be upwardly indexed to match. So any questions or? See if there are questions, members of the council. Seeing and hearing none, hold for just a second there. Do we have anyone online on this item? We do not. Anyone with us today in chambers wish to comment on this? I'm gonna give folks just a second here in case they wanted to dial in. Seen and hearing no one, is that correct, Ms. Bush? Thank you. There is uh, the recommended action on here is to approve the ordinance and direct it uh, to be placed on a future agenda. Is there such a motion, Ms. Brown? Seconded by Ms. Golder. Debate or discussion, seeing hearing none, we will move to a vote. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We are on item 29. This is an item relating to sidewalk vending ordinance, administrative amendments, and program update. Ms. Nguyen, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Good afternoon.
Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Vivi Nguyen, and I am the Principal Management Analyst with the Planning and Community Development Department. I'm pleased today to be joined with Laura Landry to give you an update on the sidewalk vending program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today we are providing an update on the first year of administration of the sidewalk vending program under Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 5.82. City Council adopted the sidewalk vending um, ordinance on April 12, 2022, and directed staff to return to City Council this year to provide a program operational update and budget request. We have identified eight items for your review. Um, these are cleanup amendments in the ordinance, and the sections are really related to cleanup in the definitions conduct, permit application process, condition of approval, and expiration and renewal. And I'll be more than happy with Laura to answer any of the questions you may have regarding the amendments. Um, it, we are really intended to clean up the items here before we head into the new season. And this is based on our experience from after one year of administration. And we're really looking forward to sharing with you some of the items that we have uh, accomplished for the most recent sidewalk vending year. For the, first, for the first season of the administration of the sidewalk vending ordinance, which is from April 1st through October 31st, staff has the following programs. Program updates, 68 permit, uh, permits were issued, 25 written citations were issued, and eight impoundments. We also want to provide you a budget update. Um, so we were here in March of 22, and last year we had approved um, program funding for fiscal year 2022, and we also had approved uh, funding for fiscal year 2023, and we were also directed at that city council meeting to come back for fiscal year 2024 to provide you some program updates as well as just general estimates that we're looking for in 2024. Um, so with here in 2022, we did have approval of $205,000 and we ended up spending only $54,000. Um, the reason being is that um, we decided not to use the funding towards um, private security and we used that towards contracted third party um, to provide additional support for code enforcement. Um, we also ended up not using an electronic um, citation system because we deemed that it was incompatible with really being in the field um, and that it would just be easier for us to develop paper citation that we would end up tracking rather than dealing with um, software. And in 2023, um, we had approved, or City Council had approved $205,000 as well. Um, in our expected expenditures going into the end of the fiscal year is going to be $194,000. Um, this does not include the code compliance um, supervisor role. So City Council had approved that new position. And so um, City Council had also approved the position and we hired that uh, position in December of last year. Now going into 2024, uh, you will see this uh, included in the planning and community developments budget proposal. So these are really tentative numbers as we're still flushing it out. Um, we are, um, since the packet uh, has been posted, we are suggesting additional um, support for Friday evenings, um, just so that, especially during the peak season. So uh, we've accounted for um, additional $30,000 in here. And um, this would also exclude um, the code compliance supervisor in terms of just really looking at um, contracted uh, code support and supplies. Uh, and you will see us back again um, included in our budget uh, proposal more formally in a couple months. We have the staff recommendation for city council review and approval. If amendments are approved, the sidewalk vending ordinance has a second hearing um, anticipated to be held on the 20th of February. If the second hearing is um, approved, then it's anticipated to, um, for the ordinance to take effect on March 30th of this year. 
the sidewalk bending um, season, second season, is to start on April 1st. And Laura and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions or comments by council, Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the updates. I am just, I have a question about the change, one of the specific changes that I didn't hear mentioned and I'm just trying to understand um, in 5.82060 on the permit expiration and renewal. I see that you are uh, trying to set up a, a regularized schedule where permits expire at the end of ostensibly the season. Um, and I'm just wondering though how that will work because it, it, it seems like it will make it, for people who apply for the summer, um, or mid, maybe mid-season, they're gonna be paying the same amount. I know it's not a huge fee, but um, the same amount as people who apply every September 30th. Um, and I'm just wondering why you're recommending that change. Absolutely, that's a great question, council member. Um, well, the first aspect is that as we first just launched our season, um, we learned that it was an administrative challenge trying to track all the different expiration dates. Um, and as people come in the first time, we found that some of them didn't want to add on the parks permit. So then we have to add on another timeline of when they come in, maybe three months later, they want a parks permit. So now we're managing two separate timelines. We also have to think about their business license timeline and when that expires. So we're really looking for an opportunity to consolidate the timeline and we were looking at September specifically um, so that we could have a chance to kind of ramp up everyone before the start of the, um, the end of the season really, um, that's the beach street season. And so we also looked at the mobile vending ordinance which also has a renewal period of March. And so we wanted to have a chance to kind of align similar to sidewalk vending and mobile vending, although they're not on the same timeline just having a more consistent opportunity. So administratively, we wouldn't have to reprint permits, uh, permit cards and conditions of use uh, every couple months as people c come in. And just a quick follow-up, um, does it, it feels like uh, the end of season is a time when that, that will make sense for the kind of flow of the vendors and your office? And Correct, um, because okay. we do. Uh, we realized from this experience we had an influx of vendors coming in to add on additional permitting so they could vend on Beach Street. Um, and so during the peak season, they cannot vend on Beach Street. So when they can vend on Beach Street um, in October, they want to come in. So it made sense for us to align that timeline. Council Member Bruner. Thank you. That was also one of my questions. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, so I'm still, um, if you could just clarify um, if someone comes in, um, let's say they, arrive, they want to start and apply in June, how is that process different? Can you just kind of briefly state what that looks like. Yes. Excellent question. And so that's, for example, June of this year, they would come in. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so administratively right now, um, what will, similar to we have an influx of vendors who came in in March or May of last year coming to apply. So in terms of those subset of um, applicants, they would, we would allow their, um, their vending to continue until September, which will then carry on that. And um, if someone were to come in in June of this year, we would also try to align it so that when they come in, um, they would be vending, depending on when this ordinance yeah. would be approved, um, they would come in and they would have to renew their new permit in September. Okay, and the price is the same. Correct. So it would Irregardless, be regardless. Correct. August, they would still pay the same price to and renew in September. Correct. And then my second question, um, there in the track changes document, which was really helpful to see it that way. Thank you. Um, there is. I guess I'll read the the number five point eight. 
2.030 sidewalk vending conduct. Um, and I'm not seeing a page number on this online version, but it's um, A3, except for the brief duration of time for a roaming sidewalk vendor to conduct sale, to maintain ac accessibility standards, sidewalk vendors shall not place or allow any obstruction to be placed on the sidewalk that would reduce the width of the sidewalk to a minimum of 48 inches excluding the curb and excluding any sidewalk areas that are made non-passable due to any posts, parking meters, street trees, planters, or signs that have been installed on the sidewalk, etc. It goes on. But two of those uh, changes in red. So the first one, my question, except for the brief duration of time, how is that defined and who defines it? Brief dur duration of time. Laura Landry, Code Compliance. Um, so the brief uh, time is the interaction that it takes for the roaming vendor, whether it's to sell you know, uh, food or merchandise, to be able to just do that quick transaction. So that is a brief that cannot permit, uh, remain in that condition where the sidewalk vending is, is not accessible to, for instance, uh, strollers or wheelchair. So there needs to be accessibility. It's still not clear to me what that, but I, I understand the intent of it. Um, I just wonder if there's a way to uh, consider the clarifying what that brief duration of time. Um, would it, it would entail the few, you know, couple of minutes to be able to do the transaction, uh, yeah. the exchange of, you know, whether it's monetary or the merchandise. And then what was interesting to me on the second part, the second edition here was specific examples were given um, of parking meters, street cheese, planters. Um, and again, the language could be slightly tweaked to maybe um, in general, say something like in general items such as these items, because I can think of several more things that would fall into the categories. So I can just see little wiggle room. It's it's just not really clear, like a bike rack, for example, or you know, just whatever there happens to be a freestanding directory or something that is not listed here. And um, so, just a little clarification there, I think, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for the presentation and the work on this. Um, I just have one question. What's our process, as, as part of this process, what is our process in working with current permitted vendors and, and getting um, feedback from them on what's working, what's not working, and, and how did that, um, you know, how did that influence what was put together and brought before us today? Thank you. Um, I think I'll take the first part in terms of kind of sharing the application process and then ask for Laura's feedback. Uh, she really has been on the ground um, providing the, the eyes and the ears. I think for the application process, um, the biggest challenge so far has been the language. Um, we have really um, tried to provide the information in multiple languages, specifically Spanish, especially for our vendors. Um, and that's also one of the things that we were um, thinking about when recommending these changes too, is how do we make this process easier? Um, and the main driving part of having the annual kind of a set timeline is that we don't have to have them coming in multiple touch points and that once we have their information, we can just send them the permit, give them the information and they're ready to go. Um, I think the other aspect too of um, providing some of these was there was a lot of confusion about where they could vend or what the rules are. It, it is a lot. Um, and so we wanted to provide as much clarity as we can. Um, and I think in our intent of clarifying the flag, the poles, the trash bins, like you can't be vending near there because there was a lot of confusion because they see a trash can. Why can't I use the trash can to dispose my items? And I think that's part of the educational experience um, there as well. 
to add to what Vivian just stated regarding clarification, I think um, in my conversations with the vendors out on Beach Street and also on Pacific Avenue, mainly on Beach Street, they needed to have the clarification as the type of equipment, size of equipment that they had in the areas that they were located, that they were um, assigned to. So they, providing that clarity, whether it's in the conditions of, of approval or in the ordinance, provided a lot more clarity to them. Also, one of the other items was um, the enforcement official that's okay, who's enforcing the ordinance. And so we provided that information verbally, but um, it was a clarity for them as well to be able to see that in the ordinance as to who was enforcing that and who they can talk to regarding any questions they have. Thank you. Council Member Golder. all your work on this. I, I know it was quite a nuisance a few years ago and I think it's really made a lot of progress. I do have a couple of thoughts and um, the first one is in regards to sales tax remittance. Is there a mechanism for us to ensure that these vendors are paying, paying their fair share um, to contribute to our city's budget? That's an excellent question. Um, we had a chance to also talk briefly with the finance department to understand because the requirements um, of the to get a vending license is to get a state seller's permit. Um, you have to get uh, the city's business license, and of course, they have to pay for the city's respective permits to vend. Um, and so, currently, we don't have a mechanism set up to ensure that they are paying the sales tax. Um, in our feedback with the finance department, they're not. Um, it's a, a non-regulatory, and so um, we. One of our enforcement mechanisms is that you have to get the business licenses and the respective permits in order to vend. Is there a way that, that in the future it could be required um, where a vendor would potentially show proof of payment of sales tax to the state um, prior to receiving a second year renewal? That's an excellent question. We'll be sure to research that further. Okay. I have a couple other questions. Um, is there anywhere in here where we're t addressing hours of operation for the vendors? Yes, uh, we have the hours of operation addressed in the conditions of use. And so um, while this ordinance here is a more of a high level guidance, our condition of use that gets issued with the sidewalk um, vendors that includes a permit and also a condition of use um, that specifies the hours they're allowed to vend. Okay. And then I did notice about um, that People could have one dog on a leash or one pet on a leash. I know there's a lot of dog lovers around here, and I'm not going to be popular for saying this, but is there a reason? Is it for, um, you know, uh, for the ther therapy dogs? Or is it um, support animals? Or is it just because not everybody likes dogs and pets, and they make a mess? Absolutely. Um, that's a good question. And I think we wanted to ensure that included, for example, support animals if they needed to. Um, and we do have a community of um, homeless individuals who have these vendor businesses and they do have pets with them. And so um, that the intent was for support animals, but also realistically, some of our vendors are homeless and this is a way that they make their sale and their living. And then, sorry to keep asking a million questions, I don't want to dominate the time, but I, my next question, and I've brought this up before, is about kids. I've seen kids at these booths for hours. Is that allowed? Usually the, um, I, I want to say the minors that I have encountered when I was doing the sidewalk bending, they are there with their families. And um, while I do understand that some of them might look quite young, they're, um, I have had conversations with some of them that are 15 and 16 years old, which of course they're allowed to you know, work. Um, and so they're doing that with their family. So these are families that are out there um, you know, bending with their children. Okay. I, it, yes, I've seen some that are quite younger than mm -hmm. that um, in different parts other than the beach area. And it was concerning to me just knowing the you know, work permit process and how many hours kids are allowed to be out working, even if they're with their parents at work, it, it seems a little, um, the conditions seem a little harsh. Um, 
the the uh, the next question I have is about are the are all of these vendors sole proprietors or are any of them getting the license and then having other others serve as vendors for them? That's a great question. Um, so the in terms of when they indicate on their business license, it includes sole proprietors. Um, and so what a vendor could do is apply to be the main owner, and um, then the applicant can add on operators so that they have to show additional documentation ID and be added to the vendor. So if I was the owner, I could ask Laura to be an operator for me as long as Laura shows all the justification and the permitting and whatnot. Um, and then Laura can then just add on. Have you seen that much? And so, like, for example, the people that have, I've seen, like, they, I've seen, like, a white van just drop off people on corners with selling flowers and fruit and whatnot, and it's, like, one person going place to place to place. Is that one vendor? Are they allowed, like, multiple spots around? So for the vendors that are on Beach Street that are assigned to different locations, each location has its own separate permit, um, sidewalk vending permit, and that operator is assigned to that permit itself. So... It's an individual with a permit that is assigned to that area. Okay. Um, okay, I swear I'm almost done with my questions. My last question is about um, trailers or like food trucks that park. And um, I know they're not allowed on sidewalks, but are they allowed to just dominate the meter all day long? Or I've driven by and seen them not even using the meter at all. Is there any rules around that? So for a parking, um, I, we do know that um, the vendors that are out there use the parking areas to be able to, you know, uh, vent in the location that they're typically parked in. Um, and so there's, they're not vending from that location. They're just using the meters and they're paying for the meter. So there's, it's just. That, yeah, I was, I was talking about like ones that they set up like a little they're actually selling like food from a truck or something in a parking meter space. That's what I was talking about, like all day. Um, so we have mobile vending, which is separate from sidewalk vending. And so if okay. they're vending from like a food truck, um, that would fall under the mobile vending. Okay, so that's why I was confused. It was by the bowling alley is where yeah. I saw it. Yeah. Thank you for answering um, all of my long questions and, and um, I, appreciate, I appreciate your work on this, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Golder, Ms. Watkins. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I also just have I have one brief question. And you mentioned um, multiple languages and try, are, is this policy presented to individuals in Spanish or in other languages as well as needed? Yes, it is. Um, so the first time that we went in March of 2022, um, the ordinance was translated in Spanish. And so uh, we didn't bring forth a Spanish translated version to you today, um, but the ordinance will be um, translated so that it could be provided. And one of our goals is for the condition of use to also be uh, fully translated in Spanish as well. Right. And then I know in the region there is more Mixteco speaking individuals as well. Is that uh, also something that you're observing in terms of vendors in our community, or is that not necessarily applicable? So we do I have heard different dialects, but they are primarily Spanish, so they are able to receive the information. And just like uh, Vivian stated last year, we also provided all our outreach in Spanish as well, Spanish and English, including the permitting process and application process as well. That's great. OK, great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? A couple, if I might. Thank you. Uh, first of all, on Page 29.6 of our packet on this item, it indicates that there is a code compliant supervisor. If I understood, that was sort of reclassified, if you will, upwards. Is that correct? What was approved at the March um, 22nd City Council meeting was a senior code compliance specialist, and we just provided a renaming to code compliance supervisor. Who does that code compliance supervisor supervise? They, they supervise the contract, um, the uh, code enforcement contract that we have um, that are, that are going to be assisting with the enforcement aspect and the program. Thank you. Let me ask a couple other questions. I want to get into this business about the sales tax. Uh, this government decided 
last year to ask the voters to increase their sales tax, and for a wide variety of reasons, they chose not to do it. I wonder if one of those might be that some people feel as if there are two classes of tax compliance, those who comply and those who don't, and among that, it's people with brick and mortar facilities that have to comply with sales tax, and by and large, it's a wink and a nod when it comes to sidewalk vending. Uh, I am very interested in understanding more about this sales tax compliance issue. So for example, when you get your vending license from the city and you have to attest that you have a sales tax permit from the California Board of Equalization, am I right so far? And what does it, I'm sorry, Ms. Nguyen? So when they come to us to request an application, we ask for the state seller's permit. Um, so then that is one of the, the items that we request. And that has to be shown to you, not a box that is checked. When someone is vending, are they required to display their business license or street vending license? Correct. Mm -hmm. In a conspicuous place, presumably. Correct. And does that also have on it any indication about their sales tax BOE permit? Does that have any information about that? Um, I don't recall the top of my head, but I can check that out and get back to you. Do you have any reason to believe that there is any substantial portion of the folks who are vending and competing with brick and mortar businesses in downtown Santa Cruz are remitting sales tax? Collecting and remitting sales tax, do you have any reason to believe that's happening? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be raising this issue again when we get on to our next issue about mid-year budget adjustments and so on, but I do appreciate that. Uh, I'll be raising that issue in a separate context. Let me see if there are other questions or comments from council members. I want to make sure that I'm really clear on this new state, relatively newish state law on this question. If I understand the the fines and declares section of that Senate bill, it is the findings and declarations on that statute essentially make, try to make the case anyway, I think it's convincing, that in certain instances, cities, local governments have tried to erect barriers to entry for street vending, which has the effect, if I understand it from the fines and declares section of the statute, is that it, in effect, prohibits, raises insurmountable barriers for certain low-income folks to be able to engage in street vending. Am I right about what that statute says? Yes. Okay. And in that regard, which I don't think is a bad statute, I suspect you know most of us would probably have voted for that. Um, would you would you agree or disagree that collection and remittance of sales tax is or is not a barrier to entry? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't have the, all the information to give you an answer at the moment, but I can give you a good answer. Yeah. My sense is that it shouldn't be, and it isn't. Either we have one set of tax laws for everybody, or we have two sets of stack tax laws. But if you have a sales tax permit from the California Board of Equalization, then there should be some evidence that you're actually, we can associate that license with some remittance to the Board of Equalization on an annual basis. I'd be fascinated to see what that tells us. Because again, the state's taking care of the part about barriers to entry. You know, you can't have something this tall or you need something that big or, you know, whatever. All the, all the economic issues that would go into barriers to entry. But collection and remittance of sales tax is not a, a barrier to entry, in my judgment. That's compliance with the law. Just like if there was some health and safety requirement in the health and safety code of the state, enforcing it is not a barrier to entry. It's compliance with the law, is my sense. I'm interested in your observation on that.
Good afternoon, Mayor and Good Council afternoon. members. Good afternoon. It is our distinguished planning director. How are you, sir? Doing great. Thank you. Good. Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, I would say that with respect to it being a barrier, we have that prerequisite for the, um, uh, the applicant, the sidewalk vendor, to actually uh, receive that license from the state. And so I wouldn't see it as a barrier. Um, to your question about um, is uh, there any evidence as to whether or not the um, individuals are um, remitting sales tax, um, I, I don't believe that the city um, checks that in, for, for brick and mortar or for, um, uh, for um, uh, sidewalk vendors. Um, I, I do believe that, uh, I mean, it, it comes through. We ultimately see what those taxes are. Um, uh, and I don't know if there's a distinction between a sidewalk vendor um, and um, whether or not we can um, and pull that information out. I, I do see our, our finance director is here. She may have some additional. I'm sure, we'll get into this. Not to put her on next spot. item. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get into this in our next item. Okay. Thank you, any, Mr. Any Butler. Any further questions? Uh, trying to decide whether to uh, split my time or load up my time. I think I'll split my time with, with, with the next item. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And thank You're you welcome. very much for your item. And Mayor, if I could, yes. if, it, if it pleases the Mayor and the Council, um, in response to Councilmember Bruner's um, comments, um, I uh, did make some um, language tweaks to the um, section of code that Councilmember Bruner referenced. And uh, the clerk, Bonnie Bush, has that. Um, and is sharing her screen now. Ms. Bruner. While that's loading, I'll ask a quick question on the sales tax. I know that um, I've had uh, conversations with Economic Development Department, and they do track sales tax of businesses in the city. So <clears throat> I wonder if it's by how they do that search, if it's by business license or geographical area. So that would... Um, be something that would speak to what um, is being asked. And if I may, I'll, I'll chime in here as well. Uh, I appreciate the questions uh, from the mayor and council member Bruner. Uh, so we do work with um, an outside company. It's, uh, its name is HDL. It's a, a sales tax and uh, public finance consulting agency that provides quarterly sales tax reports to the city. Uh, those quarterly sales tax reports include uh, gross sales as well as um, sales, sales tax remittance that come directly to uh, the city as well through the county, as well as the county pool for online sales, and it's by business. And so we draw no distinction between those that are operating as a, as a vending business or brick and mortar. They're all treated the same. They're all expected to remit and collect their sales tax. Um, and when there are occasions that call for it, there's some, there are additional audits that HDL can do uh, in concert with our, with our staff as well. And so uh, as we get into our discussions later this afternoon around uh, budget, we're happy to talk about that more. Uh, but I think the spirit behind this is um, we don't see it as a barrier to entry. It's the same standard that we hold all of our businesses to uh, in Santa Cruz. Uh, we try to make that process as seamless as possible. Uh, and we expect, um, and all businesses are required uh, to pay their, their share of sales tax. I think the distinction here is not between whether they are required, it's whether or not it happens, is my issue. Uh, it's whether or not that collection or remittance is taking place. And it would seem to me that if, I, I'm going to take a wild guess. I, I have no idea about this, but I'd take a wild guess that somebody who buys a silver trinket outside the brick and mortar silver trinket place uh, thinks that not only are they getting a good deal because it's cheaper, uh, I would be shocked if they think they are going to be asked to pay a sales tax. If the thing says $45 or $20 or $10 or whatever it says, you hand them a $10 bill, they give you the trinket and off they go. That would be my guess. Uh, but I need some, I, I want to get into this on the next item, as you can tell, uh, because it, it doesn't seem to me, 
uh, I will be quite interested in seeing how he handles. Let me make this point. It's the state government's job to decide what barriers are to entry are, and they've made those decisions. I have no trouble with that. It, it's just fine. In fact, I think it's one of the things that makes our community charming. Sometimes a little too charming, perhaps, but it's charming to have these street vendors. And whether it's mostly food over on Beach Street or it's mostly trinkets and so on on Pacific Avenue, I think it adds to the mystique of Santa Cruz. It's great. Uh, comma, but, and I don't mean that as a verbal eraser, but you got to play by the rules here. And I have a deep suspicion that's not happening by and large on the sales tax component. Mr. Butler, did you have further comment on this? I do not. Thank you, sir. Further questions or comments by members? Is there anyone with, sh with us today who wishes to comment on this item? And Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? No, I don't. We do not. The matter is back before the council and a motion would be in order. Sure, I'm happy to move the um, amended version of the ordinance. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Brunner. Second. Second by Ms. Brunner. Debate or discussion on this item? Seeing and hearing none, we will move to a vote and the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Cooper. Aye. Uh, motion carries out of an abundance of attention to detail here. Actually, the motion covered the first of the two recommendations. Can I get a recommendation to accept the sidewalk vending program update? Mr. Newsom, Ms. Gallantar Johnson seconds, debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none. Clerk will call the roll. Um. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Members, I think you think that what we're going to do is leave, but we're not. <laughs> uh, without objection, what we'll do is we're going to take up these two items we we're going to take up in the evening. We are not prevented procedurally from taking those up now. What we will do if we dispense with these two in a timely manner, at least four of us need to be here at 6.30 simply to receive oral communications. All right, everybody good? You okay going with this now? Mayor, if I, if I may, just Sir. one caveat to that after conferring with our city attorney. Uh, because the item is noticed for after 6.30, out of an abundance of caution, what we'd like to recommend is taking the presentation, council comments and questions, and then deferring action until after 6.30 and allowing for public comment at that time. That's why God created city attorneys. Thank you. All right. Let's do that. We are on item 30. Ms. Cabell, excuse me. Uh, Ms. Cavill, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a five-minute recess. We'll be right back with you.
Council is back in session. We are on item 30.1, and before we get there, I want to make sure that uh, the public understands and those joining us online understand how we will proceed this afternoon. We are going to take up the staff report and council member questions on items 30.1 and 30.2. We will then recess and return here at 6.30 p.m. this evening. At that time, we will begin with oral communication. We will then ask for public comment on the two items, 30.1 and 30.2. When we have received public comment on that, we will take a motion on both items as one item in terms of the recommendations. As you know, any question which can be divided shall be divided if asked by a council member to do so. It's the intent of the presiding officer to take this as one motion on both items when we come back at 6.30. Ms. Cappell, thank you very much for your forbearance. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Elizabeth Cabell, Finance Director. I am joined here by Tracy Cole, our Budget Manager, and Sarah DeLeon, our new Chief People Officer. And we are going to present the um, mid-year, the fiscal year 23 mid-year update. So briefly what we're going to, we'd like to cover this afternoon is um, how things are looking for fiscal year 23. Trends that we see specifically in revenue looking past over the last few years and how things are, are trending. Ms. Bush is going to give you a little bit of assistance here to get that up on the screen. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Ms. Cabell. Thank you. And so we will look at how fiscal year 23 is looking up to this point, some revenue trends, and then look at the budget adjustments and changes that we're requesting and bringing to you this afternoon. Um, that includes item, budget items um, for um, specific items in our budget as well as positions. And then I'll end with looking at a little bit of our budget strategy and sort of how things are looking going into fiscal year 24. So for fiscal year 23, we had a very strong start to the year, which was really due to a strong end to fiscal year 22. So we, in 22, we ended the year with significantly more revenue than we thought, specifically sales tax, transient occupancy tax, also some ARPA revenue. So when we um, closed 22 and began 23, we had solid reserve balances, which consisted of about seven and a half million 
in a pension reserve that's restricted. It's a sec our Section 115 trust, so that's a restricted reserve that we have. We have um, about seven million in an emergency reserve. We did move some additional money, about a million dollars over there at fiscal year 22, so we did move some money over there to increase that based on how strongly we finished um, fiscal 22. We also have 6.3 million in an operating reserve that is committed in, in our um, general fund operating um, fund balance. And then we also had 11.2 million in carry forwards. So we had a significantly large number of carry forwards for POs and projects that were not completed in fiscal year 22, but were moved forward into 23. So that particular carry forward is what, when you're looking at on the screen, our revenue, ex or our revenue and expenditures are the adjusted budget. So that increase, that strong increase in the expenditures is res a result of that carry forward. So the plan, um, as you can see right now, the adjusted budget is a deficit and the plan is to cover that deficit with those reserves that I, meant, that I previously mentioned. At this point, or at the end of January, we are running about where we would expect to be, little less than 50% um, as far as revenue and expenditures, and that's exactly where we expect to be. We usually see the largest part of our, or significant portion of our revenue and expenditures in July and August in the accrued income. So this is we're right on track. Um, looking a little bit at what has happened in the past and specifically with some of our larger revenue sources, we ended fiscal year 22 overall with $126 million in revenue. We expect to be about the same for fiscal year 23, a slight increase, $127 million, but basically the same for fiscal year 23. We're very optimistic at this point about being able to hit that target, hit that $127 million. But we're also balancing that with trying to see how revenues may change as a result of the storms. We don't know, we don't really know what that's going to look like, as well as some of the expenses that we may need to incur to get everything back up. <clears throat> as you can see from these, um, the slide here, pretty much every revenue stream, if you look at the green, the green is that is fiscal year 22, and that was saw in every revenue category, saw significant increases over 21. And really that's just an indication of coming out of the pandemic. Lots of people, everybody's back out. We've got much higher increases in sales tax, transient occupancy tax, and so on. We don't expect that to continue. We're not going to continue to accelerate and ex with revenues going up that high, but we do expect it to be stable. So that's why you'll see in 23, we kind of conservatively budgeted about the same, just mild increases, um, to what we received in 22. So now there's a lot, um, looking some at the budget adjustment highlights, I didn't put everything on here, there's a lot going on, um, but I did wanna just pull out a few of them so you can kind of see where, how these things work here. So um, Parks and Rec has seen an increase in revenue these last two quarters in both their golf and recreation classes. So we're increasing their revenue to account for that because that, we expect that to continue. And then that's also, um, we also have an expenditure, the 140,000 down there for the additional expenses for the golf operator, as well as the parks and rec instructors. We also, for um, public works, another example of receiving more revenue than we expected. So um, public works is seeing more revenue from the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Project and low carbon fuel standard credits from par public parking lots, charging stations. So again, they are increasing their, uh, hoping to increase their revenue by, or requesting to increase their revenue by 170,000. The other category here, um, at the last line item here on both the revenue and expenditure side, is non -depart what we call non-departmental, and that really represents the transfers, things that we have coming in and out of the general fund from other funds. So in this case, um, looking at the top, the revenue side of things, that 270,000 is made up of three rather significant transfers, one is 200,000 that's coming from our CIP fund into the general fund to then fund the um, new homelessness response division that's in public works. So you'll see that kind of down there below, that's what that, that 200,000 represents there, is the money's coming in from CIP and then we are requesting appropriations to support that, that division. 
There's also um, a $35,000 transfer from the carbon fund, same thing to support projects that are going to be spent out of the general fund, 27,000 in public and um, parks and rec, and 8,000 from the city manager's office. And then another 35,000 is came in from the liability fund to cover some tree work that we had done as a result of the storms. On the expenditure side, the um, large non-departmental that you see down there, that 1.1 million, that's a transfer out of the general fund over to um, our streets and sidewalks fund. And that's because, and um, this goes back many years, but we, when we passed, when voters um, passed an additional sales increase in 2008, um, the commitment to the city was that we would use that additional increase, which is approximately 1.7 million, specifically for streets and sidewalks. So in 2016, um, we start the general fund started paying on a debt for streets and sidewalks, which was about one and a half million. So this transfer kind of trues up the difference between the revenues that were committed, the 1.7 per year, and the debt service payment that we made out of the general fund. So we're just sort of right-sizing things and getting it to the right place. It's going over to the streets and sidewalks fund, so it's coming out of the general fund and going over there. So that's kind of some high points there for, for, the, um, for the general fund. In looking at some of the other funds, um, again, the streets and sidewalks will see that as the additional 1.1 million in revenue. There's also a decrease in revenue in that same fund due to a reduction in grant funding for that we budgeted for but are not going to be able to receive the grant. And then the large expenditure, or one of the large expenditures that you'll see, is an appropriation from the requested by the water department of $5 million to do a, a repayment of their credit loan. Another thing that's one reason that makes the, um, when you look at the list of projects and things, that there's a lot, it's many, many pages, but there's a lot of in and outs there, and really what we're trying to do, we've created an, a better process for tracking and recording CIP projects in particular. So what we used to do was we would just transfer from the general fund into the CIP fund and spend. But what we're trying to do now is transfer from the general fund to what we're calling a CIP reserve. And that way we get, we get the money, say the five million in there, and then we move that money into the CIP fund itself to actually spend for projects. So it allows us to really First of all, get the money out of the general fund and into a CIP reserve fund, and then be able to appropriate the, the funds and the projects in the CIP fund. So it allows us to do better project tracking. But also the result of that on this particular um, item is you'll see $5 million kind of in and out of there a lot, but it's really just a cleanup. We really are just trying to make sure that we're getting the appropriations and the funds in the right money funds in the right fund um, to make sure that it's easy for us to track and for people to be able to see exactly you know we may put five million every year we don't spend five million every year so we want to be sure that we're putting that making that sure that money is set aside and that's why we've got this kind of you'll see a lot of back and forth there so part of it is just getting it to the right fund the CIP reserve and the other part of that is actually getting the appropriations into the regular CIP fund where it's going to be On the position side of things, again, I try to um, focus on not everything, but sort of the things that um, are, are some of the major position changes. Um, sort of going left to right here for finance, we are um, requesting to delete two principal management analysts and then add a senior accountant and a safety officer. Cost-wise, it's pretty much net zero, so we're making these, this decision or requesting that to make that align better with what we want to do in the department and the needs that we have in the department. In public and on Parks and Rec, they are requesting to add a half time or a half FTE, and that half is actually coming from the city manager's office. So you'll see that delete um, half in the city manager's office and the add, those two are just basically swapping. On the city manager side, there's a request to add a half time FTE to make it make the homelessness response shelter and outreach specialist a full-time position. Right now, that's only a part or a half FTE, so we're just requesting to add another half to make that full-time. IT is also doing um, kind of a swap of positions, deleting an IT network and systems administrator 
um, I'm sorry, deleting the SCADA systems and network administrator and adding the IT network um, and systems administrator. In public works, again, two, one, one add and one delete, adding the wastewater facilities lead electrical instrumentation technician, and then deleting a wastewater facilities electrical instrumentation technician too. And water has a delete of a management analyst that was a limited term position, so um, they are requesting to delete that position, and then add a water facilities field supervisor and a water SCADA analyst. So those, and again, many of the other position changes that are in there are cleanup things, things that we may have added a position at the beginning of the year, and now we need to um, clean that up and get rid of the position or get rid of another position. So kind of sliding a little bit into fiscal year 24, um, our continued strategy as far as the budget goes is several things, one of which is pursuing, continuing to pursue cost recovery for our services, um, identify various opportunities for federal and state aid. Um, we also have our continuing the council ad hoc budget and revenue committee. So we'll be looking at um, identifying new revenue sources and then the, another thing that we're working with in the budget and kind of overall with the city is just developing a plan to address some of our infrastructure needs. So those are sort of ongoing things that are happening. Specific to the fiscal year 24 budget and the calendar, we plan to bring the budget to council on June 13th. And before that, we will have review by the commissions in April and May with budget hearings in May, at the end of May, May 23rd and 24th. a lot of words that will happen after week. But um, so um, I am here as well as Tracy and Sarah. If you have any questions or anything we can um, help clarify. Thank you very much. Let me ask if members have questions and comments on this item. I just have one question. Please, Ms. Watkins. I just have one process question. Have we always uh, run the budget by the commissions or is that a new thing? And we always have. We always have. And there, is it just specific commissions that receive that in terms of like planning or parks and recreation? Parks and recreation. Water and public, yes. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Further questions or comments? <laughs> Ms. Ms. Calder. Thank you. I have um, one question. It was on, I think, one of the first slides, and, and I saw the estimated 23 property taxes was estimated to be lower than 22. What would cause property taxes to go down? It, those numbers come directly from the county, so what they are, that's what they are expecting. It's, it's very small, it's not a large number, but um, that's, that's the, the estimates that we received. And then my other, oh sorry, my other question is in regards, it was on page two, to the fire truck, I don't know which the technical term is for the fire truck purchase, but um, I'm glad to see that was on there. I know we've been limping along and borrowing from neighboring jurisdictions. Is there a plan? Um, to continue to replace our apparatus as they age and need to moving forward? There so is. they're not we all at the same time, so right. they're staggered, right? And, and um, yes, yeah, so for, for all the vehicles. So yes, we have a replacement schedule. We have a plan for how we're going to get these things. So again, so we're not, everything's not falling apart at the same time. So, um, so yeah, and especially with the fire trucks, depending on things like can we get the funding for it? what's out there, then we may need to adjust the timeline. We've had to do that before as well. And if I could just dovetail on Elizabeth's comment. So the fire department has put together a fairly uh, detailed and thoughtful apparatus replacement plan. Uh, what you're alluding to, Councilmember Golder, is that we're at the point now where many of our um, many of our vehicles are reaching the end of their useful life. They're requiring more and more maintenance on a regular basis, becoming less reliable. And so as part of our annual CIP, we've been prioritizing the apparatus replacements. They are expensive purchases and require planning. And unfortunately, um, many, much of the timeline has also been impacted, as many things have, uh, with supply chain issues. So um, Elizabeth's team has been working closely with Chief Odie of um, working on some creative ways to, to get those replaced. Thank you, that, that concludes my comments. And one thing to add to that, that's one of the reasons that we are doing, we've, we've structured the CIP differently because we know that even though we've committed to purchase a fire truck, we can't do that right now. 
but we don't want to lose that commitment that, that you all have made for that particular purchase. So we are moving it you know, over to the CIP so that it's sitting there and ready to be used whenever we, you know, whenever it's, whenever it's needed. Mr. Collin, Tari Johnson. Thank you. I, I had a question on this slide as well. Um, the slight decrease in charges for services in FY23. So uh, we're basically what we're doing is we budgeted what we had budgeted in fiscal year 22. So because 22 came in higher, it looks like that. So so this will be updated. So as we get closer to the end of the year, and you know some of the things that we put in there, like the additional golf and the recreation classes, and some of those other things will fall into that category. It's just we you know, addition, initially budgeted very conservatively, basically looking at what the 22 budget was. And Council Member Watkins. I had a couple more additional. I'm wondering if the property tax has to do with sort of the fluctuation of the market. I don't know if that's something that's reflected or potentially is gonna be impacting it, but. But they only go up. Every time right. the house sells, but they, they pretty much but, only go up. But they haven't had as many sells lately, I think, because it's. Even so, yours adjusts every year and goes up. Huh, interesting. Okay, it'd be interesting to hear more can, about that. Yeah, I'll follow up with the county on that. Um, I know that we talked in, a, you mentioned grants and not receiving some of the grants. I know we've brought up having grant support and I'm wondering if you have any updates on where we're at with that or how that's going. I'm looking to anybody. I'm looking at you, Matt, too, if you don't have it, Elizabeth, but. Um, generally speaking, I would say it's going well. We have brought on supplemental grant support to help our in-house uh, team. And uh, as the council knows, we also have some really talented in-house grant writers as well and uh, continue to be aggressive at pursuing those opportunities. When we bring uh, the larger budget discussion, we can also include some, um, some dedicated slides related to the grant work we're doing across all of our operations because there is a lot to celebrate there and some good work happening. Okay, great. Yeah, I just was curious after that was brought up. And then lastly, I know that we had talked in our committee at the Health and All Policies Committee, but also in terms of the prior finance director about how to incorporate that into the budget process. And I'm wondering, I know it's not necessarily reflected in this item, but moving forward, um, just wanting to put in a request to see that as well. And I think the first phase of that was just sort of making everyone aware of Health and All Policies, and we're moving into the next phase. So so yes, it's definitely on the priority of what, how, how we're going to um, bring the budget back. So Great. definitely it's still there. Happy to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Ms. Brenner. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm glad you asked that grant question. That was one of my questions um, because there was a misgrant and we had had those conversations. So thank you. Um, I was curious about some of the um, missed payments and amounts that are being adjusted in here and. Um, if you could just briefly speak to, um, you know, how, what led to those processes happening and how we can, um, is that common? Um, well, this is my first budget cycle here in a while, so. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I think in general, a lot of it is just, you know, there's a lot of numbers that go into the budget. We do line item budgeting, so there's a lot of things that go on. We do um, have the departments as well review the budget. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. So it's not totally surprising that some things got missed. And then again, you know, we do try and catch these things before we fully um, bring before, between proposed and, and the adopted budget. But we don't always catch everything. And I think that um, the departments, when they see, and sometimes depending on what it is, we may not even need to do an adjustment because may, it may be able to be absorbed into the current budget. So I think a, there's a lot of factors that play into it, but I don't see this as incredibly unusual. I think it's, it's you know, we can always probably be a little bit better about checking and rechecking and rechecking, but I know that um, in order to keep the budget kind of process moving, there are a lot of moving parts and there are a lot of people that are um, involved in that process. So um, we'll continue to work on that as far as making sure that we Okay, thank you. Questions or comments? A couple of comments, if I might. Thank you for the presentation, it was quite good. Uh, on this slide that you have up right now, I want to associate myself with the comments. Uh, having been part of the county's fiscal triangle of the assessor, the auditor controller, the treasurer, tax collector, have been a part of that for a decade. 
Uh, I also wonder about the about the projection about 23 estimated on property taxes. It's a it it doesn't seem to be consistent with my experience anyway with Prop 13 in terms of how it is simply automatically indexed. Then you get sales reassessments and so on. It uh, I wonder about that. So I'm I'm imagining your source is the county government and the fiscal triangle over there telling you what they think it might be. Okay. Um, probably a good idea to put a note there that when we come back at budget hearings, that that's going to be an interesting piece to, to examine. Okay. Uh, let me ask, uh, you had a fund adjustment slide. Can we go to that for a moment? Thank you. Which one are those? General fund or the other fund? Let me take a quick look. Let me look at the other one. Uh, thank you. Thank you. With regard to the uh, the streets and highway, I'm not sure. Well, I am sure that I did not track <laughs> the uh, it's here, then it moves here, then this one goes here, and that one goes there. Will you take me through that one more time on the streets and sidewalks? Sure, specifically the 1.1 million? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, actually Measure H was passed back in 2008, and the expectation at that time and the commitment that was made to citizens is that we would use the additional revenue of approximately 1.7 million specifically for streets and sidewalks. It was not a special tax. It was a general tax. Okay. So. What we did, so the money is receded into the general fund, starting in about, um, and, and has been continuously used for streets and sidewalks. In 2016 or 15, what happened is we took out a loan, or Public Works took out a loan, an iBank loan, I think it was $14 million, to cut specifically for streets and sidewalks. Now, instead of having that loan paid out of the streets and sidewalks fund, it was paid out of the general fund. So, but the amount of the loan payments were about one and a half million, not the 1.7. So instead of, so moving forward, once the loan is paid off, we will just do a transfer every year of about 1.7 into that fund. But because general fund was paying one and a half million, we, what we're doing right now is kind of truing that up. We're saying, okay, we committed to send 1.7 million from the general fund over to fund 317, our streets and sidewalks, but we actually paid one and a half million of that directly to made a loan payment on that. So now we're just sort of truing that up to make sure that the total that gets over there represents accurately the 1.7 per year. Thank you. That, that time, not only did I hear it like the first time, this time I got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about the note not played here. Uh, as we were sitting here in mid-year, and we've just had a presidentially declared disaster, and we've spent more than a penny or two in immediate response to that, the immediate situation in the heat of the battle, uh, as well as uh, since then, we have incurred additional expenses, and I presume we have paid for those additional expenses. Uh, where, uh, can you speak to that for a moment? So right now, what we do is we run those expenses through the general fund, we submit to FEMA for reimbursement, and 10 years later, we get money. Exactly. <laughs> so this disaster, we expect the estimates are over $10 million. So we expect a significant cost. What we're doing, and we're looking at a couple of different ways of handling this, um, what we may end up doing, and I think would probably be um, advantageous for us, is to put those specifically in a kind of a non-recurring general fund, like basically pull them out because it does skew the the expenditures. Yes. It makes it hard to, and it's also, and it's easier to track. That way at least we've got everything in one place and when FEMA does pay us, we get that into one place. So we're looking at that and we're asking departments as part of the fiscal year 24 budget to um, put those, dis those packages or those projects in as decision packages and we'll have to figure out exactly where they're going to, to go. But what we will do for 23, what we've already spent, is as we get ready to close the year, we will, we've already identified the projects. They already have a number, they have a name and everything. So we'll be able to take the expenditures that we've done so far and move them over into a separate fund or put them somewhere so that we can, again, get them out of the operating 
because this is going to be a significant cost for this year and you know, many years in the future. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I know you've been waiting to discuss sales tax. So <laughs> guess let's, let's discuss some sales tax. Uh, we go back to that previous slide about the general fund revenue sources. Thank you. Here's a couple of questions about this and TOT, and they, they intrigue me for the same reason. Um, all of the lines up until the fuchsia colored line on top um, are based on actuals in the past. So those are locked down. The purple color line on top is halfway through the fiscal year, your estimate is by way of a question, for the 22-23 fiscal year, that's what the purple line is. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So we do not have something above that, uh, which is trying to look at the 23-24 FY. That's not on here. This is the current year we're in. You've got hard data on everything except the purple line, and you have pretty good information because you're halfway through your fiscal year, right? Fair enough. And, and so... I'll, I'll reserve the property tax question. We'll, when you come back, we're going to want to see what that really looks like. We're all going to be quite interested, I suspect. Sales tax is interesting to me for a similar reason. It seems that this is our first full year, if you will, out of COVID. So you see businesses, and especially uh, those that are collecting and remitting sales tax, uh, that they are back in the game now. And a lot of places that were offline, essentially, who paid sales tax because their experience was so low. What's interesting to me is that your yellow line on both the sales tax and TOT are largely the same in 22 as they are in the 22-23 fiscal year. And that perplexes me insofar as this is a way different economy than it was last fiscal year. So can you talk about your assumptions in deriving the sales tax and TOT number? So um, the purple line, both of those are really, um, well, again, first keep in mind, we budget very conservatively. So that's part of where we're coming from. It's the only um, conservative <laughs> bone in my body. So um, and, and so a significant reason that we ended the year where we did in 22 is because the actual budget for sales tax and TOT, the actuals came in significantly higher. Yeah, so, see, but you. what we don't, and what we're a little, you know, we want to again be cautious about, we don't expect that big leap that we had between fiscal year 21 and 22 to continue from 22 to 23. So again, if you look at the budget and sort of how we budgeted in 22 versus 23, it's very, very close. And we, again, with the storms and with people you know, who knows what, it's, it's just hard to predict behavior. And so I think that we are, you know, and I kind of looked at where we were this time last year and to try and, again, is, are we on track in the same sort of way? And we are, we're tracking very close right now in TOT and sales tax to where we were last year. So that's another part I do think, I don't think the sales tax is going to, definitely not going to jump like it did last year. It may be larger than what we have there, but I think those are the things, part of our fiscal 24 budget process is to look at estimated actuals. So this basically what you see here mm -hmm. is truly our budget for 23. Mm -hmm. But when we come back and we, at, at the budget hearing, we'll have done a much more deep, much more deeper, a much deeper dive yep. into them and we will have more estimated actuals as opposed to just this is what the budget is. Well, thank you for that. Uh, relative to TOT, excuse me, relative to TOT, uh, my understanding is we brought on two new TOT payors uh, this fiscal year that we're in right now. So again, I would ask the question, if we've increased the payors because we've brought on new TOT folks who have new TOT obligation, it would again ask me, even it occur to me that even if we have the same year we had last year in terms of your, your sense of this, we brought on a couple of more payors in this. Is that, uh, 
uh, you know what I I know what I'm doing here I think which is which is that I'm I'm sort of uh, you still have estimates for the rest of the year and I know you're going to plug those back in when we get to the 23-24 FY conversation so I don't I don't uh, disagree with the way you're forecasting this uh, and this isn't a disagreement it's a question about what our experience is telling us in this year that wasn't there last year fiscal year so we brought two new hotels on we're gonna bring four or five on in the next year and a half or so and we have a um, DOT measure tax measure that was passed in November this does not reflect that because that was not around. We didn't have that. We had yeah. that had not been approved. So that's one thing that's not there. Um, and again, it, you know, we have to keep in mind we're doing the budget, you know, this time of year. And so, they, and we don't usually, unless it's dramatic, we're not going to increase a budget for the revenue side of things. We'll include that as part of our estimated actuals. But so, so yes, I think that you know we're looking at the numbers and how we predicted them in February and March of last year. And there's a lot of things that have happened since then as far as new hotels coming online, the passage of the TOT ballot measure. So those sorts of things are not reflected here. Yeah. So I do, yeah. I agree that the there will be much more accurate revenue projections when we look at the budget um, at the, in May. Hey, Mayor, if I, if I could uh, dovetail sure. on that real quick. Yes. Like I, I, I see where you're going with your line of questioning. I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the bar charts we're looking at. So, you know, I think part of what you're hearing from Elizabeth is – um, caution about using fiscal year 22 as a benchmark for building out fiscal year 23 for a number of reasons. Uh, we've been facing probably the most uncertain and volatile um, economy that we've seen in the last several decades as a result of the ways in which the pandemic has affected our economy in ways we've not seen before, um, abruptly shutting down entire segments of the economy uh, overnight. Um, we're still recovering from that and trying to get a sense of um, what the baseline will look like once the dust is really settled. Mm -hmm. 22 is not a good indication, That's I right. think, of what our baseline will be going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so as Elizabeth also points out, uh, we, we always are very careful about not overestimating the revenues that we have coming in. Having said all of that, there's some bright spots on the horizon. We have new hotels coming online. Tourism seems to uh, continue to be strong uh, and stable. And you see those numbers reflected in the TOT. You see those numbers reflected in the sales tax. And we, we hope that those, those trends will, con will continue. Uh, so all of that folds into also looking at the fact that sales tax is lumpy, right? So we, we receive a larger chunk uh, in, in the summer quarters than we do, uh, as well as the, the tail end of the year during holiday shopping season. So. Sure. Trying to take all of that into account based on where we are today through the end of the year and come up with those estimates. Having said that, we hope that those numbers exceed the, the estimates that we're showing you uh, today. But all of that's factored into these estimates. Thank you. Ms. Watkins, did you have a question? No, I just wanted to add that uh, sure. both Councilmember Bruner and I sit on the Visit Santa Cruz yes. County Board. And um, just to really substantiate your point around TOT, that there, our hoteliers are, are reporting that they're experiencing a le highest level they've seen in a really long time in terms of uh, people who are coming and using their, their hotels and then additionally. So I, I do think that's a very conservative estimate. I think we'll see a much different number later. Well, be conservative on your revenues and be not conservative on your expenditure projections and we'll all get along fine. <laughs> so, all right. Let me ask, uh, let me go to sales tax one more time here because it's, it's my particular ho hobby horse today. Uh, do you receive disaggregated information from BOE relative to sales tax by permit holder? We get from, from our consultant HDR. We do get the specific information like what's part of the pool and what, you know, how everything. And we do get it by, it's confidential, but we do get it by, by business. So we, we do have Why is it that. confidential? The, by the, the, um, the totals are not confidential, but the specific businesses are confidential. We can't release that information. Like we can't say how much revenue is generated from a specific business. We can do but it. But you know it. Yeah, I, I, not off the top of my head, but yes, I, I so do you, have that. But and you we can know do it by it, category. Like we it, could say, you know, cannabis, how much do we get from that? Or, you know, are those I'll get to that in a minute. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but let's talk about, let's stay with the sales tax for a moment. So you get a disaggregated number 
by permit holder from BOE, uh, from its consultant who presumably gets it from BOE, and, uh, and then you know, uh, but that is not something you can release to us, nor can we release it publicly, so we can't know that, but you can. I just want to make sure I understand how this works. Yes, it cannot, it's not public information. <laughs> the detail by vendor is not something that we um, are allowed or can release. Fascinating. We do it by category as far as type of business, but we can't. Could you do it by category by, let's say, you could say the visitor serving industry and the this and the that and so on and sidewalk vendors and so on. You could, you could if, give us information on that by, by, those categories. If, if that category exists, if, when they register with CDTFA and they get their selling permit and all that kind of stuff, if that, whatever they indicate as the type of business, yes. Good. That's Ms. Watkins. Sorry, I just have a follow-up question just because I do the surveys for our schools and if we have too small of an N, right, in, in terms of the businesses or sample size, then if you're going to disclose by category and we only had, for example, one cannabis business, that's going to obviously indicate that business's right, revenue. Right. So is there a certain threshold in terms of the N or the amount that you have within a specific category that you can release publicly? I don't know that off the top. I mean, I'm sure there is, and I could get that information from HDL, but Thank yes, you. They're, 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 we will not release anything that can be identified as a specific business, whether that's you know, four is a minimum five, whatever. And, and just to dovetail on that real quickly, because um, it is really fascinating data, um, our uh, sales tax consultant does provide us with a non-confidential quarterly report that aggregates some of that data by industry, kind of shows you trend quarter by quarter, year after year, as well as larger economic trends that are happening within each of those industries, hospitality, restaurants, um, you know, auto and transportation, uh, the, those, types of, those types of categories. And the reports also show us um, how those trends are, um, are, are, are shifting in terms of our largest sales tax generator, right? So we, we also get reports that have top 25 sales tax uh, by quarter, and we're able to track how they're doing um, uh, throughout the year. Ms. Bruner. City manager beat me to it. <laughs> I was just going to say on some of those sales tax reports, you know, we are able to see in in certain um, uh, order of um, how it's shown. Um, does it show, I guess my question, does it show um, past due or not paid or someone is zero or? Show the past quarters, but it's what's been paid. Not. But it doesn't show if someone hasn't paid. Well, it'll be zero. But Does it show yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, do we get a, a total amount of sales tax paid and then sales tax not collected? So we know what what we would have collected had it been. We don't, it's, it's just a zero. So we won't know like what that or what that business should have paid. We only oh. know they didn't pay. So if I understand it, the only way to sort of get to your point is through the periodic auditing process that they use, and that is a system designed to learn some facts, but mostly it's designed to be an inhibitor against people not doing it. Because you could, if you hold the license and you're not showing very much, you're going to be a pretty good target for the audit. Uh, the audit shows whatever it shows, but it's designed to be a, a, a disincentive to not paying your remitting, uh, collecting and remitting your sales tax, if I understand how BOE handles that. And what I, what I would also add to that is um, HGL, along with other sales tax consulting firms, have rich data on each business's performance over those, um, each, each reporting period. If there's an anomaly, right, there's a particular business that's generating a certain amount on a consistent basis, and there's a quarter where it's not reporting for whatever reason, uh, that same level of, of, um, of, of gross revenue, they'll flag that and investigate it further, and that's part of the work they do on our behalf. Sales taxes are the single largest source of the general fund, so there's a reason for focusing in on it, I believe. Uh, property tax, you almost can't evade it, very hard to do. 
transient occupancy tax pretty hard to evade. It's a pretty easy thing to figure out. Um, charges for services is an internal issue, and that, that's very certain. It seems like the sales tax is the most open for evasion of collection and remittance by anybody who's a, who holds a sales tax license from BOE. Um, so given that our interest is that it is not a de minimis portion of our general fund, it's a huge portion of our general fund, do we have the independent authority to do anything relative to the sales tax by way of compliance or auditing or any of that business? We do, H, we do contract with HDL to do audits. So, um, how, do, how do they make those choices on what to audit and what not to audit? A lot of it has to do with what Matt mentioned when there's a difference, when they see that. Also, a lot of times there'll be a correction for, um, like maybe they were remitting sales. They didn't report themselves as being in the city limits. They may have been somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so then um, HDL will discover that, and as part of that discovery process, we'll go back X number of quarters, I don't know how far back they go, maybe three or four quarters, and, and but then they will get them on track. So I think a, lo a lot of it has to do with the variances that we see. So if it's, you know, we get a $20,000 in one quarter and zero in the next, then that's going to trigger HDL to um, investigate. You know, we really do focus a lot on the high tax, you know, and we that's how the information is presented usually to us. And when we're looking at specific um, businesses, it's, you know, top to bot, like the largest to the smallest. So um, so an, a, their audit process may follow something like that. We have to, I don't know exactly what their um, criteria is, but they are constantly sort of out there looking to see where we may not be collecting sales tax. Fair enough, good. Other questions or comments? Ms. Bruner, and then- I don't wanna to take too much time and I'm happy to follow up um, with you um, if need be. I was wondering, how often that HDL has done an audit process for the city of Santa Cruz? And also, is there an extra cost? Is it part of the contract? Is it's already accounted for in the budget? All of the above. <laughs> so, All of the yes, above, okay. We, there is a separate um, part of our, our contract that is specifically for sales tax audits. We don't initiate that on any kind of timetable. They are sort of constantly doing that as part of the service they provide to us. So we, unless we see something, if we see that, oh, well, we know that this new business just opened up and we're not seeing any sales tax or haven't seen any for the last three quarters, then sure, we, we can initiate that. But really, our contract with them is that the sales tax auditing piece is part of, is a separate piece we, that we, we do book and we pay and um, purchase orders separately. But they are, part of that is that they are, constantly kind of working with CDTFA and also looking at the business licenses and trying to figure out, you know, who's where and who's not where. Ms. Watkins. I guess maybe just to add on to that, in terms of the trend to move to a cashless, you know, system really, I'm wondering as you brought up sort of these transactions that in the past had primarily been, you know, with cash, but now there's things like um, Venmo or Zelle or whatever. Is that also factored into the kind of the auditing process for some of these folks who hold these licenses that in prior years maybe had done cash transactions primarily, but now may offer a cashless option? Well, you I, don't have to know that, but I'm just curious in terms of a trend because now people don't carry cash anymore. <laughs> it's true, and I don't know. Um, I, I, HDL is really looking at things that are reported and so or, and things that are not reported. So if somebody, you know, does a lot of their business through and reports some of it, but some of it is cash and they, you know, they're not going to necessarily know that. So it really is, a lot of it is done, it's what what is reported. And if it looks like an anomaly, that triggers an audit or a closer look at it. Or if it's something that we identify and say, please go look at this. And I think if I remember correctly, there was like legislation that was passed at the, the state, I believe, in terms of having some system in place for tracking these independent businesses being able to do some of the transactions in that way that would probably have gone kind of under the table, if you will, back right. in the day. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Will we be receiving a separate report on item 30.2 with regard to personnel positions? Is it, or are you including that? I'm including it's all in one, we're good? It's all in one, Okay, yeah. 
Maybe we had on that maybe there was another person testifying as well, but it's all from you, correct? Okay, we're good. There was here if you have any questions, but um, but yeah, good. but this is really everything. Thank you for thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, we may be at the point as far as we can go here. Is that correct, Mr. Condotti? We should bring a halt to this, and what we would do is we will recess until 6.30 p.m. tonight. We will return, take oral communication. We will then return to items 30.1 and 30.2. We will take public comment, and we will take action at that time. Everyone clear on that? Any questions about that? Okay, I got lots of thumbs up around here. All right, without objection, we stand in recess until 6.30 p.m.
Ms. Bush, are we good to go? You tell me when we're ready. All set. The hour of 6.30 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session, back in order, in order to be very careful about having this. Uh, Ms. Bush, would you be kind enough to help us establish a quorum by calling the roll? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, we will return, excuse me, we will begin this evening with oral communication. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address the council for up to three minutes on any subject under our jurisdiction, but not on today or tonight's agenda. Uh, I, sir, are you here for that purpose? Come on forward. Sure. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Bush, you will keep track of if anyone's online for us. Do I have Thank three you minutes much. or two minutes? Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Do I have three minutes or two minutes? Excuse me? Do I have three minutes or two minutes? Three minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Council. My name is Eric Rodberg. Thank you for hearing my comments tonight. Um, last June, I applied to the Building Department and PG&E for a permit to upgrade my electrical service to 200 amps. That's the minimum size required for a small home to con convert all appliances to electric. After weeks of delay, PG&E determined that they had to upgrade their equipment before I could upgrade my service. Currently, PG&E has given me an April 2023 estimate for completing their work. That's a minimum of 10 months since I first applied. My city building permit expired after six months. They were gracious enough to extend it <clears throat> for another six months. Uh, I currently have a 70 amp service. For context, a Tesla wall charger requires a 60 amp dedicated 240 volt branch circuit and most other EV chargers do as well. I don't live in a remote area. I live one block from Van Mission. Building electrification is not in the same league as a sewer lateral or low flow water fixture mandates. It's many times more complicated, costly, and time consuming than either of those. <clears throat> Before staff proceeds with developing ordinances mandating existing building electrification, council should direct staff to obtain a detailed street by street map of PG&E's existing infrastructure and its capacities. This should include detailed information on the capacities of its transformers, electrical lines, substations, switches, and other vital infrastructure. Specific amperage and voltage capacities of all existing equipment should be shown. Once this is complete, city staff working with PG&E should map out the PG&E upgrades required for the city to implement building electrification. This roadmap should identify specific capacities required on a street by street level, equipment needed to reach those capacities, time and manpower to install the equipment and cost. <clears throat> a deviation from my prepared remarks, there's no way you could possibly expect someone to be required to do building electrification in order to sell their house. Just for me, I'm not trying to sell my house. This is a minimum 10 months just for PG&E to get their side done. That in, this information on the existing capacities and outline for what's needed to be done in order to get it up to the capacity needed in order for building electrification is a necessary prerequisite for building electrification. It would be imprudent and premature to let staff develop mandates for knowing what infrastructure upgrades are needed to implement those mandates. The city's current electrical infrastructure is grossly insufficient. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your, your input, as you probably know. Yeah, go ahead. Just, sure. um, the information I gave you is just the receipts, showing that that is, in fact, my correspondence with PG&E, and I can give you much more detailed information if you have any doubts. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Anyone online? Good. Good evening. Someone is online, and we appreciate your participation this evening. Two 
minutes or three minutes? Oh, there's hardly anybody. Three minutes sounds good. Okay. Uh, it's a time of nationally of general police negligence and brutality, untempered by the reality of a growing number of police murders each year. The evidence is clear, as is the city council's inaction, a refusal to stop enabling and funding this dangerous culture of violence. Wasn't Tyree Nichols' brutal murder enough? It's not a few rotten eggs, but a sick and violent racist police culture. When will the SCPD clean house? A few years back, the SCPD refused to release racial stats of their arrests and their citations. They wouldn't respond to stop racial and class discrimination, to end selective policing, targeting the most vulnerable. All non-consensual stops need to be documented and made public, particularly those shivering and sleeping outside. Where are the millions of dollars of homeless funding going anyway? How much of that goes to sweeping out those in parking garages who are huddling against the cold and the rain? or trying to get a meal there and getting arrested for their trouble? Why haven't toilet and hand-washing facilities been replaced for those survival camping next to Highway 9? Police privilege. Rubber stamped by this council, and of course this council's anti-homeless laws. Qualified immunity and other special powers embolden cops here and statewide. Reform efforts are steamrolled past. This afternoon, we saw a bad process ram through. The public had no idea what was being voted on. A Brown Act violation, if there ever was one. Yet Mayor Fastlane Fred Keeley, who I want to thank, by the way, for extending the oral communication, makes up the agenda and presided over the meeting. He took no action to respect legal process. A disgraceful and abusive decision today. The council voted on an item with no public information, all moving ahead without apology. I say shame, but what use against the shameless? Thank you for the extra time. Thank you, Mr. Norris. Anyone else online? Good. Welcome. Good evening. Yes, hello. This is Garrett. Hey, uh, my Panda Express fortune cookie tonight said to be brave, try something new. So I'll explain my different perspective than the council's DEI theories of inequality. As a semiconductor engineer, I learned one never solves any problems looking in the wrong place for causes and answers. That industry is extraordinarily functional and as diverse as any, except there was a decided lack of black engineers like none. Ideally, in a multicultural society, each ethnic group can maintain their culture and find acceptance within a necessary overarching common meta culture. The original meta culture of the United States was based on the European Christian Judeo anti colonial and religious freedom ideas detailed within the Constitution. As other ethnic groups arrived, they made contributions to the meta culture and assimilated in the capacity to function under these common ideas, including speaking English while maintaining and contributing their cultural identity. Since East Indian Americans have the highest average income by far, about 60% more than uh, the average person, they excel in this assimilation while maintaining their identity, but so also do Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, or Pakistanis when compared to the hardly privileged white people who earn about a national average income. While parts of black culture have found acceptance and success in the arts with blues, jazz, sports, pop culture, politics, uh, other parts are hugely problematic, demographically relative to other races, sometimes by an order of magnitude. Too many in the black community have an immense character problem with excess expressions of violence, criminality, teen pregnancy, abortions, being illiterate, and are being used like dish rags by the cultural Marxists to do their dirty work of destabilizing and fomenting revolution in America, spreading anger with victimization and race hatred narratives. The meta culture comes down hard on criminality and violence as it should, and there are regrettable human events in that, but the answers to these larger real problems can be found examining the successes of those cultures that have intensely strong multi-generational families preaching discipline and education believed in earned success and have not been trapped in the quicksand 
of the welfare affirmative action state that destroyed black families where three and four black children are now raised by only one parent or neither. The search for problem answers needs to go elsewhere besides your defective DEI methods. If there is a happy ending to this story, I would say the black families on my block are among the nicest people there and seem to be doing very well with their Corvettes, Mercedes, and RVs and are examples of what a better new face of black America middle class is. I believe it's because they have complete, strong, multi-generational families. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else? else? And anyone else with us wish to make or uh, participate in oral communication? Seeing and hearing none. We are finished with that aspect. We are resuming our work on items 31.1 and 31.2. These are the mid-year budget adjustments and information on the financial status as well as a resolution regarding uh, various adjustments that need to be made to various personnel positions and so on. We received a thorough presentation from Ms. Cavill early on, or earlier today, asked our questions. Let me provide an opportunity now for members of the public who may wish to comment on items 30.1 and 30.2 on our agenda this evening. And Ms. Bush, I want to give folks an opportunity in case they're online uh, that would want to do that. Um, yeah, we currently have one person with their we hand do. raised. Yeah, let's, let's hear what they have to say. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hey, it's me again. Hey, <laughs> there's a lot to absorb here. And I got to say, I don't know if I like that whole idea of you're discussing all this before it was scheduled to be discussed. It just seems awful. But anyway, it seems like the bottom line is you plan on expending $9.3 million more than planned where the plan originally was to run reserves down to zero, which begs the question, should you be planning larger expenses when it sure seems like you're out of money to be start with? All these whoopsies that are mentioned, uh, like we forgot that mandatory expense here and there in the budget adjustments tells a lot about your fiscal methodologies. It's amazing to me, you, you, need, uh, you see no need uh, to start yesterday assigning spending priorities starting with critical services and working your way down to the wish list asking hard questions about value and need because your mission is to provide the pervasive needs wants of the, that the people are willing to pay for running out of money violates that last condition along with the failed measure f which says the public really doesn't want to pay anymore for what you're selling you spent a million dollars getting the first electric garbage truck going you are continuing to hire people, even though the rate of hiring over the last 12 years far exceeds the population growth rate. The time for questionable extravagances like DEI personnel and training, extensive climate change crusading, additional paid holidays, derivative living wage inflation adjusted pay increases, living wage instead of market driven wages, no layoff union provisions and future unfunded monetary commitments can all await the day when you have done the hard work to create a fat balance sheet reserve. Yours is overdrawn. Got me what else, but take a harder look at all the outside money. Matching money is wasted money if it isn't a priority critically needed. Grant writing is wasted personnel if it isn't priority critically needed. Free money isn't always free if it doesn't always cover your costs. And anyway, all that money isn't what the city people need, want, willing to pay for anyway. It's the doings of whatever outside big money wants. You might want to take a look at your priorities of inviting and enabling ever more poverty into the city versus via the sanctuary city, city status, fostering a nonprofit economy, maybe uh, have less high priced consultants and do some work yourselves, and maybe fix whomever or whatever is inviting that national record homeless population here. It's time to wean yourselves off of all the woke politics and eco-sustainability and spend all your time prioritizing how to become economically sustainable. Maybe somebody can figure out if this is the biggest mid-year negative budget correction in history or where it ranks. Can't be far from it. If you don't come away from this meeting with a commitment to lower this $9.3 million, it's game over. You don't know what a checkbook is. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. We appreciate your participation. Um, nobody else. No one okay. else. Okay, good. Anyone, um, one more time, anyone who wishes to address us on 
these two items on our council agenda. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Oh, these are mid-year budget changes. I'm, I'm going to give you a minute there to see if you want to make a comment. Oh, no, we, we have been there and gone. Do you have something? you Did you show up this evening for that? Yeah. I'll tell you what I'll do because we're going to probably, I'm going to guess we're going to dispense with this in a few minutes. I'll return to oral communication give you an opportunity, okay? Okay, of course. Uh, now, reset. We are on items 30.1 and 30.2 in our packet. Where we are to reset you is that we have received staff reports. Council members have asked questions. Uh, this would be the opportunity for anyone who is with us, either online or present in the council chambers, uh, to speak to this matter, uh, either item 30.1, 30.2, for up to three minutes. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? Okay. No one with us wishes to comment on that, all right. The matter is back before the council. The chair would uh, entertain a motion on first on item 30.1, and there are a series of recommendations on page 30.1.1 regarding receiving a presentation, adopting a resolution, authorizing the city manager to allocate budget changes. Is there such a motion? Right, here we go. So we, got, we have lots of motions around here. I'll second. It's a moving kind of council. Yes. All right. Ms. Brown, second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Ms. Watkins. Ms. Watkins. Yep. Ms. Watkins. There we go. All right. So uh, I am wondering if you might be kind enough to accept what I consider a friendly amendment, only you can determine that, uh, which would uh, add additional direction to the finance director and the city manager. Uh, when they release the uh, fiscal year 23-24 budget, that they have a report in that document or supplementary to that document regarding sales tax collection remittance uh, relative to street vending. Is that uh, acceptable to you? Yeah. Acceptable? Yes. Without objection? Debate or discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none. Roll call, please. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Motion passes unanimously. We'll get you some WD-40 for that <laughs> next year's budget. All right, we are on uh, uh, the item uh, uh, 30.2, and on page 30.2.1, we have uh, recommendation to from the human resources folks to adopt a resolution regarding classification compensation and to adopt a resolution amending the budget act uh, to appropriate funds for various purposes enumerated in the item is there such a motion so moved so moved by ms watkins second by ms Kalantari johnson uh, is there a debate or discussion on this item seeing and hearing none the clerk will call the roll Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Uh, out of an abundance of courtesy to our members of the public, sir, we are back on oral communication. We welcome you to the microphone. go three well usually we do two but you it's at night you're the only one left let's do three minutes three okay there you go see what happens <laughs> oh it started okay um first of all you are some of the best leaders in the nation um truly i mean if you look at what happens in santa cruz we're doing some of the best things and doing things some of the best ways um, I'm trying to speak to the highest level of things. Um, I'm going to say some words, and the only point is if you resonate with these words, you may naturally work on them. 
Um, or uh, sorry, work on them. You may not. Your heart may naturally work them out in the whole community. Uh, there are some things that are kind of not working. The homeless population, some mental health things, some aggressive kind of behaviors happening. <laughs> some which are horrible. Some which are don't physically affect others, but are kind of um, aggressive. I myself, I bought a house ten years ago. And I was young, and I kind of stopped caring about other people. And I want to really, really make a point for anybody who's listening. That was a mistake. I was wrong. We need to care about each other, or bad things happen. So what I want to talk about is just a couple of words, just for everybody who's listening, care, concern, um, consolidation, uh, healing, contentment, happiness, affordable housing for all, affordable food for all, happiness, dignity, and respect for all. Um, and I think that's that's all. I'm asking for those things for you know from the powers that be. Can we put these things into motion uh, for the whole community? Is that three minutes yet? Okay. okay. You got half a minute left. Half a minute. Yeah. Um, and the question is: Is how do we make these things happen? Consolidated, harmonious solutions that take the whole into account. We were all taught physics, chemistry, psychology, art, math, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The answers we need may be beyond all of those things. There may be something entirely we're not seeing beyond therapy, beyond psychology, beyond um, there's neuro-linguistic programming. There's now like somatic exercises and breath work. You're doing fine. You want to need a couple of seconds to wrap oh. up, it's fine. There's something I think we're not seeing and that we're missing. I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm not the answer, but perhaps collectively we have the answer to, for our society and for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your compliment. That's very kind. Thank you for the generosity of your spirit tonight. Very much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Further business to come before the council. No, no. Ms. Bush, no. Uh, well, uh, typically that's in order, but Thank yes, you, uh, Ms. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Golder has moved to adjourn. Is there a second? Oh. Uh, let's see, who, uh, Mr. Newsom seconds that, and I know that there's a lot of debate about it, but it's not a debatable motion. <laughs> Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed motion carries. We stand adjourned. <laughs>